Give me a background. When did you uh, when did you get into dogs, and what made you get into um, the American Bulldog? Well, I uh, I was born in 1963 in St. Louis. Uh, as a little kid, we lived in the city, and I'm not really sure why, but I've always been uh, an animal freak. Started with like horses on TV, and uh, and just. I don't, I can't even remember what age, but I was always drawn to dogs. When I was a little kid, we lived in the city and, uh, I can remember even at four years old, five years old, walk in the alleys to look at people's yards <laughs> to see dogs. And, uh, I wanted a dog so bad. I used to grab a stray and bring it home and tell my dad, man, he saved my life, you know? Uh, he's he's really smart and if, and then i learned that if he had a collar on it had a tag with, with the owner's phone number so then i'd you know just beg him and finally i did get a dog when i was we moved to the county and we had a yard and i don't know why he said yeah but because my dad is kind of a neat freak as my mom was too she they just everything has to be perfect and they grew up in the country in sicily and uh Dogs lived outside, you know, right. and people on a farm had a dog. You know, people in the city had no, no reason to have a dog. So I got a dog from a pet store uh, that my dad finally took me to. And they told me it was a Beagle uh, Manchester Terrier. Uh, but I'm pretty sure she was uh, half pit bull. Oh, okay. Uh, that she was tiny. She was like 36 pounds. She lived to be 19 years old. <laughs> wow. They, they never wanted dogs, but uh, they, you know, I moved out. I was in my 20s and, uh, and she, she died. I tried to have her put to sleep because she couldn't see and hear, but the vet, I picked, I got this vet that was just insensitive and kind of goofy. He's like, why do you want to kill her? Like, I don't want to kill her, dude. Did she blind? She can't hear very well. And she's not the dog she used to be. But anyway, I, by the time I was five or six, I knew all the dog breeds. I could tell people stuff. Um, and I was just a weird kid. <laughs> I just, I used to follow dogs at the park and talk to anybody that had a dog. So when I was younger, I floated from different breeds, you know, German shepherds and all this that I loved. And, uh, then I got enamored with the uh, Doberman and I'd go to shows. I'd go to working events, anything I could do. I met a lady at the park behind our house that, uh, <clears throat> was walking a Doberman puppy. And eventually I worked for her just a little bit after school as a little kid, uh, you know, but I think I was by 12. She had a kettle of uh, Dobermans. Her husband was a, a wealthy attorney and she was into dog shows. And I went to dog shows with her and just, I subscribed to Doberman Quarterly and Doberman World, <laughs> all kinds of crazy stuff. And uh, I actually got uh, a Doberman when I bought my first house in 1980, I think it was 87 or something like that. And uh, he he was from like the number six dog in the country, this big brawny looking Doberman called uh, Rainbow's Running Bear. I paid a ton of money for him. I got him and uh, I guess he had something, oh, well, he had something wrong with him because he never matured. Uh, much bigger than like 60 pounds. His dad was about 75, big, big dog for Doberman. And uh, turns out by two years of age, she was diagnosed with uh, a rare disease called diabetes insipidus. Hmm. And by three years of age, I had to put him down. Wow. And uh, like I said, I've always been a dog nut. I had a, a pretty good sized library of dog books. That's, that's the, that was the internet back then. <laughs> you could buy dog books. And sure. uh, I'd read about American Bulldogs and 
I had every book there was about pit bulls. I knew tons of history and tons of stories and legends and all this stuff about pit bulls. And uh, my wife at the time, I didn't think she could handle a pit bull. Uh, so I started looking into American Bulldogs and I read about them like in 1982. I had bought this book called uh, The World of Fighting Dogs. Uh, Carl Semantic, uh, yeah. Yeah, Carl Semantic's book. And uh, I started looking at Dog World and I call in all the people. And back then, you know, you called long distance. There was no cell phones, it was all landlines, and it was expensive. I mean, if you talk to somebody for an hour, I would get uh, phone bills that were like three, four hundred dollars because I'd I'd called all these different people and talked to try to learn stuff about the breed. I I used to call Mr. Johnson all the time, and uh, I had bought a my first American Bulldog in 1988, and uh, I really didn't know her pedigree or what she was. She's probably more of a painter dog because I live outside of St. Louis and. Uh, Joe Painter and Mike Margentina are from Chicago, and uh, they were putting out a lot of dogs in the Midwest. So I'm just guessing that I had the papers. I never sent them in. She was a white dog, longer muzzled, standard looking dog. She was cow hot. She had pink eyelids, no pigment around her eyes, and uh, which I, I thought was weird. And she was high drive. I mean, obnoxiously high drive. And I had the Doberman. I had some little mutt, uh, cattle dog, chow chow mix. And I uh, had a big wooden fence. And by the time she was six months old, she was busting out the pickets until she grabbed the neighbor's Labrador and pulled it through and started beating the crap out of it. And uh, about $600 worth of vet bills later, I decided that, and she was also getting after my cattle dog a little bit, who was a real sweet little dog. She she wasn't really gamey or anything. So I found her home, and uh, by then I realized my Doberman had to be put down. You know, he was sick. And uh, I'd been talking to Mr. Johnson and sent him a deposit, and uh, I wanted a super dog. He called him. <laughs> if you got a dog that was like, he, a puppy that he thought would be a regular size, like a 90 to 100 pounds, he'd say. Those were a 1000 bucks. If you wanted a, a super dog, the super dogs were 120 to 150 pounds, he said. And those were 1500 bucks. And that was like 1993. 90, yeah, kind of 93. Or no, I guess it was 92 or so. Because I waited forever, and uh, the puppies kept dying before I could, you know, they reached eight weeks old. And uh, finally, he told me about a guy that had pups that were a little older, like 12 weeks old, out of Oklahoma. They were down for this stuff mainly. And I, that's where I got my first mail that I kept. And uh, he did. He, he was a super dog as far as size. He was like 148 pounds when he was fully mature, which is really, really, really huge for an American Bulldog. And and kind of rare, even for them. It's really rare now, but it, it was kind of rare back then. And uh, that got me started. When I got him, I thought, you know, he's so big. Uh, he's so, uh, you know, there's not a lot of dogs truly his size. Everybody advertised in the back of dog world. And I, I thought it was always odd because in Dobermans and AKC breeds, they, nobody posts the weight. But in, in dog world, every ad gave the weight. And uh, looking back now, it, it was pretty much lies. <laughs> Everybody added 20 pounds to their dogs. You know, if you had a 110-pound dog, it was 130. If you had a 120-pound dog, it was 140. Right. I see a lot of that in, um, in Rottweilers, too. Like, my dog is... He's like a hundred pounds, but everybody that sees him, they're like, "Oh, what is he? A buck thirty? A buck forty? I'm like, "No, not even close." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. I, I did for a while there see Rottweilers that were gigantic, like 150 pounds, and uh, but back in the 70s, uh, I saw a lot of a lot of Rottweilers because I'd go to these specialty shows. And they'd have Rottweilers. Sometimes they'd have their specialty show at the same time. 
And I think it was probably one of the real big craze, you know, 70s into 80s. And uh, they were some thick jokers. They were nice looking dogs. Nowadays, those Rottweilers are. I have a friend that that uh, trains dogs. He sent me pictures of what is considered a great Rottweiler, and I'm like, oh my gosh, they're getting bully. They're they're making them really short muzzled and kind of caved in in their nos their uh, breathing, you know, between their eyes there. The the stop. Yeah, I've and, noticed uh, that. Um, I forgot. There's like a some some slang term for them, um, but I forgot exactly what it was. But yeah, I uh, I got my first look at one of those probably I don't know a little over a year ago. First time I saw one that looked like that, and it's just like, well, they ruin everything else. So I mean, I guess the Roddy's next in line. Yeah, I thought, wow, what is going on? That just just seems weird. But yeah, a good Roddy should have a a real full voluminous top muzzle and some muzzle. They were they were never really really short muzzle dogs, but. Oh, well, that's what's going on. I don't know what's going to happen in 50 years with dogs. It's uh, it's weird. I, I guess I'm in a weird generation that, I don't know, people were, like, even in American Bulldogs, 30 years ago, uh, all they ever talked about was size and how badass, what these super athletic dogs can do. You know, they used to advertise in Dog World, can pull... 200 pounds for 10 miles you know uh, they did they did do stuff with their dogs but they the johnson type dogs tended to be big size but even they weren't preoccupied with the short muzzle and and all that stuff it was size and uh you know if your dog had two and a half inch muzzle that was normal you know they that matter of fact that probably the bulliest dog the most popular really really bully dog was a dog called uh, gator red and uh he was a hybrid what they call hybrid which is a stupid term but they started using it in the american bulldogs because there's two types originally I used to call them the scott type and the johnson type but uh, nowadays everybody calls them well they're supposed to be called the standard type and the classic type so and it came about because when they all got when johnson and scott got together and wrote the standard uh and sent out to preserve the southern type bulldog that uh, had been in the united states uh for hundreds of years they it, it never was an organized breed and they had to run around and try to find stuff you know they had two basic dogs that were the foundation, a dog called Mac the Masher and a dog called Dick the Bruiser. Dick the Bruiser, Johnson bought from somebody's front porch. And uh, I don't know if he had a pedigree or regardless, the pedigree he, he uh, originally registered was just made up. There was no, no uh, real pedigree. And there was no pedigree to Mac the Masher. Uh, by the time they bred, got Mac the Masher and started breeding him, they said he was really old. So the only picture of him, he looks pretty old and deteriorated, but he looked like a Colby Pitt, but colored up like one too, you know, like a brindle bodysuit with a white head. And, but he had a blunt muzzle and a pretty thick muzzle and wide skull for a pit bull. So, or not a pit bull. I mean, he, he wasn't a, a pit bull that we know of, but I, I believe my theory is that American Bulldogs basically derive from cast off catch weight pit bulls that, uh, you know, pit bull men, dog fighters, you know, how they test their dogs at a certain age and they test them to see if they're gang or if they have any ability. And if they don't, uh, they usually put them down, but if not, they give them away to somebody that could use him as a pet or use him as a catch dog. Because the uh, hog hunters, uh, a dog like that is a little bit better. They, they're game in a way, but they're game at grabbing and holding a, a wild hog. They're not wanting to get in front of it and try to fight it and attempt to kill it. Like some of the really game pit bulls will do, or even some 
just drivey American bulldogs, that that can be a problem because uh, a dog, an eighty pound dog, is not gonna kill a two hundred pound pig. No, and he's not gonna get in front of it and fight it. The, the, the a hog hunter wants a dog that's going to run in, grab immediately, and hold, and basically become a boat anchor. A really good catch dog is just going to go in there and grab and and hold hold the pig. So then the hunter can catch up, grab its back legs up, and dispatch it. You know, without the the worry of it turning around and slashing him and cutting him up. So. Basically, Johnson and Scott had rounded up dogs. They weren't all dogs that had pedigrees. Obviously, when they started out, eventually it came out that uh, to get them registered, they had to come up with some kind of couple generations of names. So some of them have no pedigree. Some of them have just, and and they came out that they basically just. Uh, or give you know put up put down names just to get them registered, and that was in like 1973, 1976. And uh, what happened was they both had the same dogs. Obviously, Dick the Bruiser was owned by Johnson, and Mac the Masher was owned by Alan Scott. And the funny thing is, the Scott blood, that original Scott blood, was a little more line bred or bred off of Dick the Bruiser and Johnson's dogs were a little more heavily bred on Matt the Masher because uh, he had a dog called Sandman the Great and that was Matt the Masher's son and uh, after Mac the, after Sandman the Great who was about a 90 pound dog and Mac the Masher is probably about the same size maybe 85, 90 and Dick the Bruiser was smaller his call name was Tiny because he was like 70 pounds, 75 pounds, which those are the typical size for for the country type bulldog at the time. I think uh, Don Matthews, who's been in the breed forever, has even been in an interview and said, yeah, back in the 60s, a big dog, a big American bulldog, white bulldog or whatever they wanted to call him at the time, was about 70 pounds. That was big, which goes on with my theory that uh, uh, they've had this, this breed and a lot of American breeds, you know, red bone hounds and black mouth curs and catahoulas and you name it, plot hounds. They, they've probably had some of the earliest uh, war dogs that were called the Alant in them because in 1492, when Christopher Columbus came to the United States, or not, not one of the United States, just North America, South America. Uh, he had these dogs, and it's well documented, and there's artwork, and, and it's, they even have stories about certain dogs. They were called the Alant. And uh, the Spanish aristocrats and uh, royalty raised dogs, you know, and I, they raised Alants. They had kennels that probably were hundreds into the thousands and they used them like they did for hundreds and hundreds of years before that for various things like catch work on big game or a butcher dog you know the butcher would go into the field and get a bull or a cow or uh they use them for war you know which is originally what the allot was it, it came from they say this uh, north african uh, nomadic tribes called the Alani. They were nomads that went all over the top of Africa and into Europe. And they had the most badass war horses and they had the most badass war dogs that were like livestock guarding dogs. And when the shit hit the fan and they were fighting, they jump up and grab somebody else's horse or they grab a guy off or if they got an arrow or something, somebody fell to the ground, they finished the guy off. So these dogs were not a breed like what, what we think of today. You know, they didn't have papers. 
nobody cared if their tail had fluffiness to it or, you know, if their muzzle was a certain length. The only thing that determined whether it was a good a lot was what it could do. And that's pretty much how all dog types of the day were, except for probably, you know, the royalty that had toy dogs. But everybody that had a dog that needed to do something, it, it, it was defined pure by, by the job it did, not by the way it looked or not by the way that it didn't have paperwork. So these lots, if you look at artwork, they can range from a houndy, doggo, Great Danish looking dog to um, a little bit heavier uh, greyhound to just straight up game bred looking pit bulls. Uh, they varied. Some of them even had a little fluff to their tail. Some of them had fluffy ears like a Saluki. They, they weren't, but they evidently Christopher Columbus had these war dogs that were trained up nasty. I mean, they killed people. They fed the natives to them. The, the Indians that encountered them were horrified because in North America at the time, the only dogs they had were like 40 pound dogs. And, and a lot of the natives didn't keep dogs like we do. They were more like uh, village dogs that would just beat up the scraps and kill vermin and follow along with them. They weren't, they were small. They were like 30, 40 pound dogs. So here, and they weren't aggressive, you know, they weren't bred for that. I mean, they weren't bred for anything. They were just straight dogs. And then here comes these big, tall, scary dogs that would kill people. And uh, they were trained, you know, they were trained to do that. Uh, they also helped on hunts and did all kinds of stuff. So when the dog came to North America, the Spanish started uh, settling and the French did too early on, they had these dogs and I'm sure they bred to whatever other dogs they imported because the Alano, the Alant of the day was, was the bulldog, was the mastiff, was whatever hound, whatever you needed, it, it could do it. So I'm sure that blood was here in the United States through all these other breeds and just floating around because whenever you had a dog that could do something, everybody bred to it. Every, you know, that's just the way it worked. And you think about life, people came here and you had Indians and you had crazy wildlife. It was like moving into Alaska because there were bears and wolves everywhere. It, it was rough and tough. It was, there was no cities and no roads. People had to make their way. So they had whatever the best dog they could have. And that dog had to bring home the bacon and protect and do all kinds of stuff. It, it wasn't a, a, a pet in, in so many ways. It, it had to do a job. So the original, I'm sure there was a good percentage of that blood. Uh, I think that went along, uh, you know, they, as they settled more, they still started doing the crazy stuff that they did in Europe and in the UK. Bull baiting and dog fighting, and they imported dogs, fighting dogs from Europe and fighting dogs from the UK and from Ireland and Scotland. And it's documented, of course. Colby's uh, brought a lot of a lot of stuff over. It's a lot of other uh, Irish immigrants brought dogs over because that's what they were into. They were they you know the, the people that worked in the coal mines, the lace workers. It was like the UFC, it was like cable, you know, it was the, whenever they had any downtime, that was what they were into. And they bring these fighting dogs. They weren't called pit bulls. They were called bulldogs and various other things. And uh, they weren't bred. Nothing was bred the way we breed things now. Everything that's bred now changed about 150, 200 years ago, and especially during the Victorian period, because People finally had a little bit, after industrialized period, they had a little bit of uh, casual discretionary income, and they got into these dog shows. These women would organize these Victorian dog shows, and uh, eugenics was a big thing back then. 
And so they started talking about purity, 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 and these dog shows. And uh, we all know what dog shows uh, have done to all the breeds. uh, This idea had changed because there, and it's still present today, as silly as it is, that there's a pure, purebred, you know, which it depends on the definition, but most people, I think, assume this dog is pure. The genetics is pure, almost as almost like it's a species that fell from the sky or evolved from different stuff, which isn't true. All all dogs are basically gray wolves, and uh, yeah, they're manipulated. There's families, and they're bred a certain way. And but before the Victorian period. It was that dog retrieves ducks, so he's a retriever. That dog points out game. He's a pointer. And, you know, breeds came about, but they were more loosely, loosely bred. It's very similar to the way a lot of the hog hunters that I deal with, uh, their main goal is they love hunting and they love catching wild pigs with their dogs. And uh, they don't care really a catch dog a lot of the guys are like well you can you know a lot of dogs will catch if you get a pit bull mix or uh various combinations you can get some that that are great catch dogs and same thing with the bay dogs which is the more important thing helping you find the pig and then bay it Uh, you know you may have people that run black mouth curves or they run plot hounds or whatever but if you talk to them, they, the dog might have 25% something else. As a good example, I I went through a period where I was just placing tons of dogs with hog hunters to prove my dogs out to see if, I, if the breedings that I've been doing to try to improve the breathing and make them functional, if it's working. And I had a guy who's a really good friend of mine now. He had a dog for me called Grace. And uh, I, I went on a hunt with him. I didn't really like what she was doing i thought oh that's not right because she 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 jump on a hog right away and which is great but then she'd get in front of it and almost as if she's like trying to fight the hog which like i said that that is a stupid (laughs) catch dog that's not what you want so but he liked her because when she jumped on the pig his bay dogs all of a sudden they get a lot of courage and they'll they'll catch when they see one dog is on there, they'll grab. And so if you get four dogs, three dogs, five dogs, all in the same pig, it, it, that pig's caught. The problem is that you're not there in time and your dog gets cut down or hurt and it, it can't hold, hold on. Those hounds are going to let go. They're not, they're not designed to hold. They're not gritty enough to, like a bulldog is stupid. They'll, they'll stay on there regardless of if they're getting slammed against trees and smashed into the ground, a good bulldog will not let go, but a hound will, the bay dogs aren't, they're not bred for that. They're bred to find it and bay it. So anyway, he tells me, Hey man, I'm going to breed grace. And I'm like, sure, buddy, who do you want to breed her to? And he's like, Oh, oh I, I'm going to breed her to Bozo. And I, I'm like, Bozo. I said, Oh, well, how's Bozo bred? He goes, Oh, uh, he's half Weimariner and the rest is Pitbull Catahoula. And I'm like, what? Why would you do that? He goes, why? Because he's a great catch dog. He's awesome. And she's an awesome catch dog. So that's the thinking that a lot of those guys are like, I don't, I want to see what the parents do. And if they're good dogs, you know, that's what you do. You breed the two dogs that work, which is true. I mean, I'm sure there's a percentage of those dogs that would turn out good, but that's what, how our breeds working breeds came about. They looked at the task at hand first, first and foremost, the the breed purity is nonsense. Like I I don't know if you've read a lot of bulldog books. There's an old tale. I, I don't know if it's true, but it could be true. Who knows? They used to say that, A guy, you know, in the medieval days came to a bull, uh, a bull baiting event, and he had a female with puppies. And people wanted to see if that female would catch, would would catch the bull. And he had her catch this bull. 
And then he came up with the sword and cut off her back leg and she held on and then cut off another leg and she held on. And the puppies brought, you know, I guess a better coin. I don't know if that's a myth, but that's the, that was, it's been written in books as a story and kind of shows you their mentality. Nobody was like, well, are they, you know, AKC? <laughs> Can I see the paperwork? You know, they didn't, that, that meant nothing. The only thing that meant anything was, is this dog going to catch a bull or catch a pig or whatever? It's the same way with pit bulls. You know, before they were called pit bulls, you know, they, the work, the, the task defined their purity. I mean, if you look at the thinking of, of pit bull men, you read the history, what do they how do they call their dogs? If a dog is game, they call it a bulldog. If it's not tested game, what do they call it? A cur. It's a cur. Well, I mean, uh, a cur is the worst insult you can give. They, they don't even consider that dog if it's not able to, to prove game. It's not even called the breed. They, they won't even call it a bulldog. So that's the way it was with everything with dogs that retrieved dogs that were used for a job a rat a dog that killed rats and mice if he didn't do that good he, he wasn't kept around and he wasn't even called that type of dog so that's what happened that's how american bulldogs came about and they were i believe they were cast off uh, catch weight pit bulls that the guys thought, I'll give it to George. He, he hunts. This dog will be perfect for that. And then George and a bunch of the other uh, hillbilly guys that were ice, in isolated pockets, they raised the dogs like a lot of poor people did. They, those people that fought dogs, they were poor lace workers. They, they lived in a hovel with grandma and Uncle George, and everybody lived in two rooms. And the dog, he wasn't in a kennel. He was in the house. And who the people that handled the dogs were the kids. A lot of those pit bulls, you know, on a Saturday night or whenever they fought them, it wasn't strange to have your kid in there handling the dog, getting in front of it when it's fighting and some, come on, man, we need to win. And that, you know how pit bulls are. They see their owner and they want to please them and they'll, they'll fight a little harder. Right. So, that's how American Bulldogs were. And they, Mr. Johnson said that uh, in interviews and stuff, he said, yeah, they used to fight the dogs and they used them for catch dogs. And he, he claimed they used them for protection, which I think they used them for almost anything and everything they, they needed. You know, if they needed, if some coyotes were getting in their chicken, chicken yard, uh, you know, or trying to kill a calf, wild dogs or wild coyotes. Yeah, they used them to catch those dogs and get rid of them. You know, it was a practical time. So Mr. Johnson and Alan Scott got together in the 70s and wrote a standard and set out to preserve this breed, Southern type bulldogs. People nowadays, people are saying, oh, they were called white English or they're called Southern whites or and all these different names. But the fact of the matter is, Mr. Johnson, there's nothing recorded. They're, they've done research and found manifests of ships that came into the savannah from Europe. And uh, they occasionally you might see it listed bulldog, uh, but most of the time it just listed dog or hunting dog, you know, that they would import. So they were bringing dogs in all, as much as they could because they need they needed dogs and uh but nobody they weren't recorded the history wasn't recorded as well as like uh, lewis colby's imports and some of the early pit bulls <clears throat> and obviously they weren't recorded in their native country either because if you look at all the dogs that started you know in the paperwork started a lot of the pit bulls they didn't have anything behind them the Leitner dogs, all, all those dogs, they had no pedigree. So it was just, nobody cared about that. I only cared about the ability. 
And that's what makes a breed fantastic. You know, that's the opposite of what we're doing now. What we're doing now is, well, my dog is pure this, and here's the pedigree. This piece of paper justifies my dog. Or they go to a dog show and, oh, my dog has the perfect ear set and the perfect tail and has a beautiful top line and it's beautiful. You know, and this judge, five judges have said, my dog's a champion. But that dog, I, I judge dog shows all over the place. You know, I've been all over Europe and I've judged, I don't know, thousands and probably thousands of American Bulldogs. And you, you're only judging what's at the show. And I, I can tell you from being a judge, a lot of times you pick a dog and you're like, ah, he's the best of a shitty lot. You know, he's the best of the of this lot. And, you know, some guys are like, oh, I don't do that. I, I don't put dogs up. If you started judging dog shows and telling a, a class of 13 dogs, well, <laughs> sorry, people, all these dogs suck and I'm not giving them a ribbon. That, that's, I've heard it happen in small classes, but let me tell you, you these people aren't going to come to the next show and you're never going to get asked to judge a dog show again. So that's the rub. You know, we get a lot of people nowadays that are, they get a dog. They don't know really that much. They just know they have a piece of paper and they think they really got something, but it's the opposite. In the old days, if you walked up with papers and said, these dogs are fantastic. And then they start working them and they're not, they're not working. Then they'd be like, well, I can tell you what you can do with those papers, buddy. <laughs> right. So that's kind of my gist of what the American bulldog so, history is. But just they, to, they, just to reiterate, not to cut you off, but just to reiterate, and this is one of the big questions that I've always had. And I've always wanted a solid, solid answer to, so, in your opinion, um, the American Bulldog and the American Pit Bull Terrier are very closely related. Definitely. Well, nowadays, it's kind of, you can scratch your head on it, but the original Bulldog that people, Mr. Johnson was out to uh, preserve, I would, I would, well, DNA proves it. The DNA profile stuff, if you believe in all that stuff, it's not a perfect science, but it, it looks at markers, combination of markers, and uh, they, it, pit bull comes up. Pit bull, in American Bulldogs, pit bulls, uh, English Bulldogs, uh, boxers, um, even Boston Terriers popped up, and a certain other breeds have popped up. But the pit bull is, you know, I tell people, you know, if you, because they used to say, Mr. Johnson used to even say, it, there is no pit bull in American Bulldogs. There's no pit bull in American Bulldogs. Well, you know, in some ways, maybe back in the 50s or 30s, you could say that because the pit, the dogs they were bred from weren't really registered as pit bulls, but those are the forebear of the pit bull. You know, when, when the first dogs were imported, they, they weren't, they started keeping records, but they weren't uh, a registered American or pit bull. You know, they weren't a registered American pit bull terrier. That came later. That came, I believe, what, in 1907 or something like that? Late, at least in the late 1800s, they came up with a name for this breed. You know, in, in, Europe and in the UK, what they call them Staffordshire Terriers or Staffordshire Bulldogs. Uh, so in some ways, you know, if you're, if you're born in the 1940s, maybe you could say, well, no, 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 these, these don't come from these, but these come down from this and that. I'll, I'll tell you, there's a, here's a typical, my research is a typical story. Uh, I have a good friend, Kimmery Lewis, he, he's in New Jersey, but he grew up in North Carolina. He's a little, tiny, just a little bit older than me. He's in his 60s. And uh, I sold him a dog almost 26 years ago, and we've been friends ever since. But he grew up in North Carolina, and he'd tell me different stuff. Yeah, you know, when I was a kid, the guy that used to read the water meters 
had a pickup truck and he had this big old bulldog. It, it was kind of almost looked like a, a big uh, bully Johnson type dog. It didn't have a short, short muzzle, but it was a clunky, thick dog. And he said, man, he used to fight dogs and he'd let that dog loose on, on strays. And he'd match the dog with local people. And uh, his, he and his dad were hunters and they kept uh, plot hounds and they kept these white bulldogs. And I, his dad was still alive uh, about 10 years ago. And uh, he was in his 80s. And my friend was like, yeah, I'm going back home and I'm going to go by there and see if he's still alive. I said, man, when you get there, ask him, what are these dogs? Where do they come from? And, his, you know, he's had them forever. So so he asked the guy and the guy said, I don't know. They've been around. They've always been around. And he said, well, what are they bred from? He goes, I, I'm not sure. He said, but I know when we get some that don't catch good enough, we'll put terrier the terrier bulldog in them. And if we get them where they don't have the wind to run, we'll put the, the plot or different bay dogs in them. And he said, I've heard tell, he said, I've never done it, but I've heard tell some old timers say that they tried and they put the original English bulldog in there, which we both were laughing like, what the, heck? you know, these people were artificially inseminating. But if you think about it, the English bulldog from the 1920s or the 1900s, the pug cross or whatever you think it is, what, you know, those freaky looking weird dogs, they had more leg and they weren't being AI. They, they were probably being helped, but they were bred and whelping natural because people weren't, people, but they were smaller bone dogs with not as big of a head. So people were even crossing those in there. It, it's, it's like uh, hillbilly resourcefulness, redneck engineering. They they work with what was available with them. So basically, he told the story. I had another uh, story about this old woman in uh, southern Missouri that I spoke to. I was putting on the first American Bulldog show at Karina Farms here in Missouri. I, I think this was 1995 or 6, something like that. And so... I knew some people uh, that were in the dog shows and I thought, you know what, I'm going to get an AKC judge. I'm going to educate them on the dogs and have them judge, which is what I did. And this one lady said, oh, there's a really knowledgeable old lady. She'd be great. So she gives me her phone number. I call her up and she goes, oh, honey, I'm older than dirt. I can't stand that long anymore. She goes, but I'm interested what is an American bulldog? I don't, is it a pit bull? And I said, no. So I started explaining the breed and she stopped me and she said, oh, oh, wait a minute. Is this a Florida hog dog? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's, it's a Florida hog dog. She goes, oh my gosh, I can't, I, I can't believe this. When I was in the sixties, my husband and I, she said, we're at an outdoor dog show in the Florida panhandle. And a bunch of us were noticing this guy walking this big white looking bulldog and it, he's walking it and we walked up to him and said, excuse me, but what is that? And he said, wow, well, this is a whole, a Florida hog dog. And she's like, what? I've never heard of that. What is it derived from? And he goes, I, I don't know. Uh, they just always been around here, but uh, I have heard tell that if they don't find any, they'll breed one of them Harlequin Great Danes to an English Bulldog. And I thought, oh my God, that just sounds crazy. But you know, if you bred a Harlequin Great Dane to an English Bulldog, you'd get some sloppy looking American Bulldog, I would bet. So the breed, it's like any breed that starts out, it, it doesn't have a, a great documentation and it's not, uh, recorded history as well as it should be. And like any history, it's the person writing the history is making it up to a point or spinning it the way they like. So, but it just makes common sense. If you look at the pit bull of the late 1800s, early 1900s, you look at Petey, the little rascal's Petey. He was a pit bull. But if you look at him, he looks more like an American bulldog, a standard type or American bulldog, more like Mac the Masher and Sandman the Great 
than a lot of the fast lane dogs today. You know, they, he didn't look like the dogs, like a red boy Jacko dog. He was white. A lot of those dogs were pied, pieball white. And if you've ever bred dogs, if you breed a pied, pied dog to a pied dog, you get more pied dogs because that's a recessive coat pattern. Uh, a lot of people in American Bulldogs and even pit bulls, they, they think that white is a color. But in dogs, white is not a color. White is the absence of color. It's called the spotting gene. So it's a gene that blocks out pigmentation on the skin and on the, on the hair follicle. And if it gets to the eye, it'll do it in the eye. And that, that's why you get these glass eyes or blue eyes, because the pigment, the color pigmentation is diluted or wiped out completely. So all dogs are a color. You know, all dogs have to be brindle or non-brindle red or uh, black with no brindle. You know, so that's the color of every dog, you know, and then through domestication, they started getting these spotted genes that would block out the the color, and you'd leave white dogs. If you if you ever pet a white dog or a pit bull that's got that's a pied dog, touch his fur, touch the white hair. It's soft and it's fluffy. You know, not fluffy, but it's lighter weight. It floats through the air more. And then touch his brindle or his black or his red. It's like an eyelash. It's harder. And that's because it's loaded with pigmentation. The other one isn't. And it's weak. It's weaker. But that came about. Uh, and people bred on it. You know, some people bred uh, the old timers in the United States. Some people quoted them saying that some of them said, you know, white dog is pure. White dog is smarter than a colored dog. So, in different regions, people cared about the color because a lot of those early pit bulls, PD, if you look at Colby's, Pinsir, and Kager, all those dogs were white. <clears throat> they were piebald. And uh, if they're all white, they're called extreme piebald. That means it blacked out all the color except for a freckle maybe on their ear. So you keep breeding white to white, and that's what you get. You get white because that spotting gene is recessive. When you breed two recessives, that's all you're going to get is recessive. You know, uh, so different regions of the United States had white bulldogs. Other regions didn't. You know, down south in Mississippi and in Texas, they had the brindle bulldog. They pride, prided on having a lot of color and the brindle ones they liked. So... And American Bulldogs, if you look, if you really research them and you go back to some dogs listed as a foundation dogs, there's no picture. And some people are like, well, a lot of people don't take pictures. No, they took pictures. <laughs> they just didn't want to show you that that dog was heavy pit or hound or whatever and had a lot of color. You know, I'd even seen it with Mr. Johnson. He had a photo album. Uh, that he loved to show people. And it had some pictures of some dogs going way back. And I looked at, I interviewed him in 1997. We went through the book on video. And uh, I didn't ask him on camera because I didn't want to, uh, you know, I knew he didn't, he wouldn't want to talk about it. He never, he told me there was a dog curled up in a black and white picture. It looked like a red bone hound. It was, I could tell it was Brindle because it was a black and white picture. I'm thinking it was a red brindle. And I could tell it was a leggy, it looked like a plot or like a, a big red bone, huh? And I said, who's that? And he goes, that's big red. And I'm like, oh, wow. Was he in the, in the? oh, no, no. I, I just used him as a catch dog. Uh, okay. And then I saw another dog <clears throat> that was fawn with a black muzzle and looked kind of like a boxer pit bull cross. And I said, oh, what about this one? He goes, oh, no, that was half American bulldog, half boxer. We used her as a catch dog. So there was a lot of solid colored dogs. So on the standard side, you'll find those, they didn't care. They show pictures of them. If you look at a lot of the dogs going back, if you'll see Mr. Bud, Tate's Mr. Bud. He was a uh, fawn dog with a black muzzle. I think Mr. Tate even said he was part pit bull. So... They were, they were there. They just selected away from it. I even saw that. My first dog that I told you I got, uh, he was 7 eighths Johnson. 
His father was a pure Johnson, extreme piebald dog called Peeler's Chief. And his mother was from that Gator Red Dog that was half, let's see, yeah, he was half Johnson, half Painter. And then he was bred to 100% Johnson dog and produced this female that had a, a lot of brindle to her. She, she had just white feet in the back, white stockings in the front, a big white pass that went into her belly. And then her head was mainly brindle with a white blaze. But when they bred her to Peeler's Chief, who was all white, he'd either produce all white dogs like him or he'd produce solid brindle. And those dogs were all huge. I knew a guy in Texas that he's bought a bunch of dogs for me, uh, a guy called Jerry Don. He had a, a brother to my dog that was 150 pounds, that was even a little bit bigger than my dog. And he was solid brindle, Clancy, he called him. And uh, they did that breeding a couple other times with a different 100% Johnson dog. And that female just seemed to click and throw all the big stuff. And... Uh, there was a guy called Sam Scarborough who had a 130-pound dog from that. He was solid brindle. He looked like a brindle bull mastiff in color. So they, these dogs didn't drop from the sky pure is what people think it pure is. And they were never bred for color. They were never bred for anything. They weren't organized bred. You know, there wasn't the internet. It was just if you bred your dog, you had a, you know, pull from what was in the county. You know, you, what do you, you're not going to get in a car and travel. There, there weren't a lot of roads. <laughs> you know, it just wasn't like that. Nobody would load up their female and say, oh, there's a guy I'm driving, you know, halfway across the country to breed. No, you, you had to know somebody who knew somebody that had a dog. And then you check it out and you breed them. So that, that's kind of the way the breed rambled along. That's how all breeds rambled along in the United States. And American Bulldogs are no different. What happened when they started wanting to preserve the dogs, there wasn't a lot of, they, they weren't common. So they had to find dogs and different people got into them and uh, wanted to standardize them and, and wanted to improve them. So it's rumored and some of it's been found out, you know, that they put pit bull, different people put pit bull in. Uh, Joe Painter, that was a different vibe. You know, their, their whole thing was not how big the dog is, this and that. They were touting the dog, whether it was a sales pitch, I, I don't know, because I don't really know the guy that well, but uh, they started their own registry called the game bred American bulldog. And, uh, those, uh, painter type dogs, standard type dogs were bred by guys that were looking to bring the dogs along, like, like working pit bulls. And they even told stories of rolling dogs, you know, or rumored that they rolled their dogs. Uh, Joe painter went to prison supposedly, who knows the truth? I don't know the truth, but they say that uh, he he and his brother-in-law got caught with videotapes of matches. And they said that uh, Painter was shipping dogs all over the place, which I find ridiculous, to be honest with you. I, you know, any ridiculous things happen. But if they were match dogs, it would be recorded. It would be in the dog, you know, game dog journals. You know, it, it would be written about it, be talked about. But I know a lot of people that were in that community. And when I ask them, they just laugh. They're like, what are you talking about? First of all, we don't, they don't match dogs. It's 65, 75 pounds very often, if ever. You know, if you look at the biggest uh, game bred dog, of the last 30, 40 years, it's May Day, and uh, he was matched at 57 or 58 pounds. He was a big dog, probably 70 pounds on, on the chain, but uh, that's rare. It's, it's just, just not, uh, it's not something anybody ever, nobody, there was no, you know, to a point, 
they're, they do it for the sport and they do it for the money of betting money. So you're match quarter pound to quarter pound. You're not, you're not fighting a 70 pound dog against a 50 pound dog. Right. It, it just doesn't happen. I mean, I'm sure some, all kinds of crazy stuff happen, but the fraternity of dog fighters and dog men, you know, if you say Joe Painter had game dogs and he sold them all over Mexico and all over the place, shipped them all over, they'd laugh. They're like, who the hell are you talking about? What are you talking about? So I'm sure they fought him and did stuff. But the whole vibe with the standard, early standard guys, Alan Scott had gotten out of the breed for a brief time and he sold all his dogs to Joe Painter. And then Joe Painter uh, had a famous dog called uh, Sergeant Rock. And, uh, you know, he was touted as being game. And, and there's no doubt in my mind that maybe they rolled their dogs, uh, but I don't think they matched these dogs. And I don't think it was. But some of those guys are hardcore ex-pit bull guys. Maybe. I, I don't know. But they, they to this day, they still have that mindset, which I think is great. <laughs> right. with you. Because the other half of our breed has turned into an old English bulldog, you know. Mr. Johnson in the 70s uh, was approached by a guy, David Levitt. And uh, David Levitt was hell-bent on producing a uh, Victorian Regency period bulldog. Uh, so he took a bull mastiff pit bull that he bought from some hog hunting outfit in Alaska and bred it to an English bulldog. And then he found these American bulldogs and uh, he leased two adult females from Mr. Johnson, and he got one from Alan Scott called Pepper Pot. And uh, he bred them to this uh, English bulldog he found that was big, you know, like 80-pound dog called uh, West Champs High Hopes. When I first got into the breed, you know, they mentioned that that was a big talk. But Mr. Johnson said, oh, he was a throwback English bulldog. He had more leg and he could run and, you know, he was alive. He wasn't like a regular English bulldog. Well, now you see pictures of him and he's a show type English bulldog. He probably was bigger, but he was purely from little show type English bulldogs. So anyway, David Levitt bred uh, two Johnson females and a Scott female to that dog. And whatever he didn't want to keep, he just gave them to Mr. Johnson. And Mr. Johnson, he claimed to use two of them, uh, two females. Uh, one was called uh, Gail Bullmead's Queen. And uh, that dog bred back to his stuff, produced this big male called the Incredible Me Machine. So that dog was 25% English Bulldog. I'm sure he was more than that because, like I said, there's been English Bulldog put in these dogs, you know, who knows? Could be going back to the 1800s. So that dog was like a hundred, over 100 pounds and kind of smush-faced looking. Still didn't look terrible, but he, he was 25% English Bulldog. Well, before that, I'm, I'm pretty sure, of course, it wasn't documented, but I'm pretty sure Mr. Johnson put a lot of big things in there. One of the main things he put in, I'm, I'm positive of, is St. Bernard because I could show you pictures of these dogs from this dog called Red Machine 3, Red Machine 25. Uh, they, they look like a St. Bernard mix. I mean, they to the T, not just the color, almost the fur texture, the length of the leg, the funky feet, the, the crappy structure, the droopy face, everything. I mean, I, this Red Machine 3... I could show regular people the picture and say, what is that? And they would never say American Bulldog. They'd say St. Bernard. And that I heard that from the beginning when I started out. People were saying, oh, I got a litter of long-haired dogs from Johnson. He's putting, English, he's putting that St. Bernard in there. So in my estimation, by that point, uh, he, he already had that cross in there. Some people say, no, it had to be Great Pyrenees, which... If you look at a Great Pyrenees, it doesn't have the uh, St. Bernard head that really, because the St. Bernard, some of them have that real deep dish stop, blunt muzzle, 
kind of bulldoggy looking. So anyway, that basically from that point on, Mr. Johnson's dogs, because he line bred on that, that West Champs High Hope cross. And he changed and started naming his dogs machine, this machine, that, and the females were sugar doll, this sugar doll, that. And, uh, the sugar doll dogs were pretty bully dogs, you know, pretty, some of them are smaller, shorter, pretty shorter muzzle dogs. And, uh, so Mr. Johnson's dogs in the nineties were one, two generations off of that West champs, high hopes. And they looked more oldie, you know, a little bit typier. They were typey before, but they're a little bit more so. And, uh, Johnson, from when I knew him, everything was size, size, size. He wanted the biggest puppies, but he always picked. He even is quoted as saying, I want a bulldog big enough I could throw a saddle on, you know. He had produced a dog he claimed was 170 pounds, and he had a special collar made for it that he kept in his mantle. And uh, I measured it. It was like 31 and a half inches buckled, you know, all buckled up. And I'm sure it was some dog's collar because it was worn. It wasn't like a pristine collar. And it had to be custom made, you know. So he had them. <laughs> he had something really big. So from that point on, even today, if you if you trace back all the West Champ High Hopes and most Johnson or Bully type American Bulldogs, it'll add up to 25%. So when he registered those dogs, they weren't registered as a cross. They were just registered American Bulldog. And he didn't pay attention to whether, what the percentage, he just bred. And, uh, but his dogs changed. In the 90s, they had that machine look, that mean machine, incredible mean machine, the red machine, Sugar Doll, all the numbers of Sugar Dolls he had. And uh, his dogs changed because he, he was in Somerville, Georgia. And his house was a small house, maybe the size of a two or three car garage. Dogs didn't come in. He didn't have a room for them in his house. He didn't well puppies in his house. He had like these little do big dog houses or these uh, sheds that they whelped their puppies in. And, and they just had yards. Everybody had a yard. All the yards were surrounding his house. If you go there, all hell would break loose. You'd hear barking, barking. These bulldogs are all go nuts. And uh, so the females had pups on their own outside. So it's hot as hell. <laughs> Georgia is kind of like it is here in Missouri. It gets hot and humid, you know. And so his dogs died. The, the, the English bulldog crosses that were really smash face, they naturally called themselves. You know, Mr. Johnson was a deeply religious man, and a lot of times he'd tell me, it's, it breaks my heart, but it's survival of the fittest. It's the way God intended it. Which is kind of better for the dog genetically. But so Johnson dogs changed. They went from this machine type in the 90s, the real bully, wide-chested, blocky-headed, to a taller uh, more Danish flavor to them. You know what I mean? They, they have some Johnson dogs today have nice long muzzles and he, he had them on his property and longer muzzles. And it was a rough, it was a rough situation. I mean, cause it was no big thing for them to run up and down the fence and fence fight and bark and race hell. And on a hot day, that'll kill these dogs because there's unfortunately whether it was West Champs High Hopes or other English Bulldogs that people put in, or just the selection pressure of selecting dogs that, that have that uh, sour mug type. The number one problem with American Bulldogs uh, today is uh, brachycephalic airway syndrome, bad breathing, loose palates uh, that block or small tracheas and pinch nares, muzzles that have no volume to the top of them to bring in enough air. And of course you get a 22 inch dog that weighs a hundred pounds 
you can almost you almost can't have as long of a muzzle as it takes to cool him down. He'd have to have a seven inch muzzle, you know. So you got all that fighting against you. Plus, everybody in the last twenty five years that gets into the dogs uh, sees pictures of these dogs in the nineties from Mr. Johnson, and they're like, "Oh, that's the style. I love that. I love that." So they selected for the sour mug or the machine type dogs. And uh, it's been getting more extreme and more extreme ever since. And I, I know there's people that have been caught crossing in more English Bulldog or Old English Bulldog or Dog de Bordeaux. Uh, and, and a lot of the breeds in denial. They don't want to say so. And they don't care. The, the bully type people don't care. It's like any anything. Uh you like what you like. And, and unfortunately dog breeding 99% of it is cosmetics and looks, you know, uh, I know I've been to, you know, I, I'm no different than them. I started out loving the big bully dogs. I I'm on record. I, you know, you can look up the dogs I produce. I produced some big freaks back in the late nineties, early two thousands. But after about f five, six years of breeding, I produced this dog uh, and sold them to these people in Virginia and a uh, nice couple. They're a little old, a little younger than me. And they had two little kids and, you know, like 10, 12 year old kids. And, oh, I mean, just great people. They call me, send me pictures and tell me how much they love the dog. And the dog looked gorgeous, beautiful dog. I was really proud of the way he looked. And he was just a pet, just their, their pet. Well, they put him out in the backyard when they go to work. Well, one day the neighbor was getting a new roof put on his garage and the garage backed up to the property line of their house. And you can imagine he, he went nuts, you know, a crew of guys up there ripping shingles off and, you know, hammering. And so he went nuts all day. And when the kids came home from school, they found him dead and he had blood coming out of his nose and they call and they're crying and tell me this. And I, that just freaked me out. I'd already kind of known of a lot of the famous big dogs, heat stroking, or you get some weird stuff. They say, Oh, I got hit by lightning <laughs> or something like that. But that, that experience just gutted me. I, 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 to think of those kids walking in the yard and finding their dead dog with blood coming out of his nose, he'd overheated and overheating for a dog is a horrible death, dude. It is, it is, you know, they, a dog's temperature is 102, and when a dog gets into 105, 106, and it's hot outside, and it's a stupid bulldog that doesn't give up, he won't sit down like a, like a normal dog in the shade or drink, he keeps going. It cooks their organs. I mean, it, their heart will explode. Their lungs bleed. It, it's a horrible, horrible thing. So from that point on, I was like, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to fix this. Oh my God, it's taken me 20 years and, and I fixed it pretty much, but it's not a hundred percent fixed because if I started breeding different, it'll come back. And, and I've done, I've tried everything and everything you can think of. And I talk about it and try to make people aware because uh, in the last three months I've had, I don't know how many people contact me that their dog died. Some people I know, some people I don't know. And I guess they do it because I, I post a lot of stuff on the internet about the breathing problems in the breed. And like I said, a lot of people are in denial. You get a really cool looking dog, you don't want to admit it. But you'll see they'll post the most beautiful looking bully big type dog, American Bulldog, and there's no volume. <laughs> the sound's gone or they have music over it. Because if you... If you could hear the dog running around the yard, you'd hear <laughs> that palate is loose, you know, and they don't sound good. So that's the number one problem we have in this breed. Uh, the standard dogs don't have their problem, but, you know, it's a sad fact that uh, every the percentage of American Bulldogs bred every year, the standards are pretty low. The standard type dogs just aren't in demand. The, the general public doesn't look at them and think, oh, man, 
I want that. But they do with the, the bully dogs. The bully dogs are like, dude, I love that dog. He's got a big old head, wide and thick bone. And now we've got dogs that are a little more refined with more muscle and all that stuff. And that's what I'd say 80% of American Bulldogs born every year are the bully Johnson type. Uh, now Johnson, basically Johnson type, there's a whole crew of, they call themselves 100 percenters. They only want to breed dogs that are 100% uh, Johnson blood. If there's one eighth, anything else, uh, uh, they don't want that. It's got to be 100%. So that those aren't as popular. Uh, it's a small, that's a small thing. The bully type, which can run anywhere from seven eighths Johnson to three quarters Johnson. Those are the ones that everybody wants. You know, they, they sell for the higher price and uh, they have the most appeal to people because unfortunately we're a society that values cosmetics and dogs more than anything else. Until there's a problem, until they fall over dead or they bite your kid or something, you know, until then, they're like, oh, man, I love that. Oh, he's so cool looking. And uh, unfortunately, those type of dogs don't breathe good. They're falling over dead constantly. And uh, it's because I've gathered because there's so much English bulldog in the dogs. And probably, I know there's Dog B. Bordeaux was crossed in by one guy that's no longer in the breed. And uh, it got into the Johnson dogs, too. And uh, so that's kind of the big to-do in the breed, I think. The number one problem. I used to think, oh, you know, I check hips, I check elbows. You know, I'm really con conscientious about the temperaments. And the breathing has been the hardest thing to fix. I started out, when I set out to do it, I thought I'm just going to outcross the standard dogs, right? And, you know, one, I'll just breed to a really good standard dog, and then I'll breed back to my bully stuff, and it'll be cured. It'll be easy, right? No, it doesn't work that way. I bred to this dog through a good friend of mine that was in Mississippi. Uh, he started out with a strain of standard type dogs. They're they're a separate, totally separate uh gene pool than the typical standard dogs. They're called Man of War. There was a dog called Man of War. Now, they say that he was in the journals and he, he was a pit dog and all this stuff. I don't know what he was, but the, the dogs that came from that line tended to be heavy colored, heavy brindle or heavy red. And they threw white too, but mainly they had a lot of color. There's a, a famous dog called Vader Red that this guy had. And he, he was pretty well known as a really good working type American bulldog. He was like 90 pounds. Uh, the, the bully type people look at him and like, oh, that's just a pit bull. That's just a red pit bull, which kind of, they kind of have a similar phenotype, but there's some other stuff in there, I'm sure. And uh, I bred my friend, Jack Robinson down in Mississippi, started uh, wanting to appeal more to what people the puppy buyers wanted, I think, and he bought a Johnson dog. It was actually a three quarters Johnson dog called Peeler's Oki. And so he took his man of war females and bred them to him. And he got these huge rear ends, thick dogs. And he produced this one particular dog that was like 130 pounds called uh, Bigfoot. He was colored kind of like a St. Bernard, a red saddle and red eye patches. But he was about 25 inches tall and thick i mean he had a rear end like a quarter horse he, his bone was so thick it, it was amazingly crazy thick he had a big head but he had a long muzzle it was about three and a half inches three and a quarter inches but it was wide mastiff like muzzle mm -hmm. so i had that really big dog who was kind of a cousin to him because his dad oki and my big dog's mother were litter mates so I sent him a female, and he called her Monica Lewinsky. It was during the Clinton deal. <laughs> and uh, Monica Lewinsky was the ugliest pup in my litter. I think that was my first or second litter. And she was an all-white female. She grew really tall, way taller than all the other puppies by eight weeks old. And that's who he wanted because he wanted big. 
So I sent her to him, and she did. She got to be a 120, 115, 120, which is huge, like unheard of in the breed. And he bred them together and produced this puppy and asked me if I wanted it. He was just the not coolest looking pup. And he was red and white like a St. Bernard, too. I called him Vindicator, and I got him, and I started using him. I only bred him, really, that I used uh, one litter. And it was to my really bully female champion. She was the first uh, bully American Bulldog champion. Uh, her name was Broadzilla. And I line bred off of her, basically, early on, which I should have line bred off of Vindicator. But the Vindicator had that weird man of war blood. And so Bigfoot, his father, had two sisters and they were solid brindle. They looked like bull mastiffs, pretty much, or like a doggy Bordeaux. They were like a red brindle. Well, after I had used him or, you know, had him and raised him and uh, some of my enemies, <laughs> they were like found pictures of his sisters and posted them, look. Fido's crossing dogs, you know, because look, this isn't an American bulldog. It's not white and it's weird looking, you know, and that's just because the man of war dogs crossed to the Johnson with a little bit of painter in there through heavy color. So I tried that man of war stuff and it did bring some stuff to the table, big teeth, uh, a more of a performance build. Uh, but holy crap, it, it didn't do nothing for, for breathing, period. And, you know, there's no book on how to clean up breathing in, in these dogs. Not that I could find. So, and I couldn't find anybody that done it, really, honestly. So, I kept trying. So, then I bought a, a black and white female from a guy up in upstate New York called Gail Raponi. She, I wanted to breed to her father. It was a dog called Badger. He was a black and white dog. And he was like 100 and something pounds, really thick, really cool looking dog. But he had a longer muzzle. And he was uh, basically, uh, there was a guy called Bill Heinz that was responsible for producing standard dogs that were pretty good hog catching dogs. And uh, there was a dog he produced called Combat that this guy had up there that they line bred off of. And that guy bred to had bred her to this black and white male that was kind of bully looking called Aslan, Aslan. And he was uh, true forms Aslan. Well, I looked at the pedigree and it was standard blood. And so I, I was like wanting to breed to that male, but it's too far for me to drive. And they, they didn't sound like they really knew how to ship semen. So he's like, yeah, I got his daughter. So I, I went in and bought her. And well, now I realize, you know, now it's come out that Aslan, his father, Aslan's pedigree has question marks all over it. We, they, nobody knows <clears throat> how he's bred. The mother came from a guy that bred American Bulldogs. The father, now I find out years later, was a dog that some guy was training in Schutzen and sport work. And this guy that uh, produced Aslan and his female at that place training. <clears throat> well, the guy showed up one day and left his dog there and said, dude, I gotta, I gotta run and I gotta go because the law is after me. Left the dog. So this guy took the dog and, and just bred him. And he said it was a black and white dog and looked just like standard American bulldog, but thicker. So we don't, nobody knows what the hell Aslan was. <laughs> I don't know. So anyway, I bred to the black which black has always existed, but not, it's not mainstream. It wasn't the tip, you know, it wasn't, it was more the exception, not the rule. Alan Scott had black bulldogs. He had a dog called Dixie Blackjack. There's a picture of him with the dog when he was about 18 years old. And uh, he was a registered black American bulldog. And so that was about it, the, the black came from him on that dog. That dog, though, I can't find any black offspring. I can only find this red off female. Oh, God, I can't remember her name, but <clears throat> she was all red, and she went into the painter dogs, 
but red is recessive. So once you get a red dog, it can't throw anything behind it. It only throws its color. It can only contribute its color. So black is lost there. So Aslan's black, who knows what it came from? I have no idea. Uh, you know. So anyway, I get the black, and uh, I'm this new hog dog strain female is going to be my key to cleaning up breathing. So I breed her a couple times. I produce a really nice dog called Taz. He was a black tuxedo looking dog. He looked like a, he had a longer muzzle, blocky muzzle, kind of Danish looking. And he was a tall, 90 pound, 100 pound, big dog. Excellent dog. Lived to be 15 freaking years old. <laughs> and uh, in nine months, I took him to a hog trial, just kind of private, on private property. And uh, he was going ape, totally ape shit in this kennel. And uh, he's nine months old. So we thought, okay, we'll try him. So, man, he hit that hog like a torpedo. It was almost like there was a super magnet attached to his mouth and that, that hog's jowls. He caught so fast and so perfectly. And I had some hog hunters saying, you want to sell that dog? Like, no, no. He wasn't, to the bully crowd, he was disgusting. Like, he was a tall dog with a three-inch muzzle. They, they had nothing to do with that, you know. They're like, he's got that goat chest. I don't know why they have this term goat chest you know, for dogs that aren't really wide in the chest, which bully dogs don't really have a wide chest cavity. They have wide shoulder set, like an English bulldog. So anyway, I got the black. I started breeding Taz. Every time I bred him, he'd throw the black tuxedo, heavy color. Well, the first... First generation after him, I was like, yeah, she's a good dog. I'm going to keep her. I'll breed her. I'll breed her to a white dog, and I'll get rid of this too much color. And uh, I would, I didn't really brag about her and take pictures. She was, she was just a good dog. She was a good dog mentally, and she breathed good. But she wasn't anything I'd ever want to brag to anybody about, especially because back then I bred very, very thick, extreme American Bulldogs that were bully. So I bred her to this big inbred Brazil son I had called Shrek. He was white, had a little red patch on his butt and a patch on his eye. Bred him. She had a litter. No white dogs. <laughs> red dogs, heavy colored red, some blacks, and then some, you know, pie balls, some 50-50s. And so I'm trying to pick the best dog in the litter. And I picked this black female. Her name was Monella. So she was third generation of black and Monella breathed good. She didn't have, the, she had a pretty decent body, but she didn't have as wide of a muzzle as what bully dogs normally have. And, uh, excellent dog. Didn't show her too much either. So I raise her and, uh, and meanwhile, I produced this other dog called, uh, BMJ. And, uh, he was from an inbreeding I did with my dog go ballistic. And this dog was just, he was like a breakthrough dog because his structure was like nothing you'd see in American Bulldogs. He was straight. He had a little bit of a roach to his back. Uh, some of the guys started naming that the performance roach, <laughs> which he was a, he was an athletic dude. I mean, he was a pretty dog too. He became a dual grand champion and all that. But when he got to about 11 months old, the guy that had him and we were friends at the time, he didn't. He thought he wasn't going to be a bully enough dog. He was what they call a hybrid or a standard in between. I knew better because I knew his dad and how his dad threw. So I got him back. I was so excited to breed this dog. And at about 14 months old, that bitch Monella came in heat. And uh, I, honest, honest to God, I didn't put much thought into the whole pedigree and what I was going to produce. I just, the first bitch that came in heat, I wanted to breed to BMJ because he'd never been bred before. And like I said, he was a, a breakthrough dog. He had superior structure, superior movement. He was just an asshole. Like he, he was a great dog, but he had an attitude and a half and he was like a peacock you'd enter him in a show ring or anything. If there's anybody around, he'd just show off. He just put his tail in the air, put his head up. And he thought he owned 
the world. It was his world and you were living in it. But he was sweet. He loved kids, loved people. You know, he, you know, he wasn't mean towards people, but he had tons of drive. He's just a, a really cool dog. At that time, it was a breakthrough for me. So I bred them together, right? So this is the third time I bred an all white dog to a black female. And what did I get? I got two white puppies that died within a few hours of being born. I got two red dogs, almost all red. And then I got three black tuxedo dogs. And I was like, oh, God, I, I can't believe it. You know, I can't believe I didn't get a break up the color. So I ended up, I was, what I had done before was any dog that had that much color, I'd sell as a pet just cheap in the papers, just with no papers, you know, I'd find them a local home. And, uh, well, so I was going to keep two black pups. Well, the guy that had BMJ, we were friends at the time. Uh, and he, he sent him back. Meanwhile, he had all these show dogs from a different breeder. They all crapped out bad temperaments, bad hips, or they're just, you know, were weird dogs. And he, he pretty much got rid of most of them. And wanted BMJ back. And we were friends. And I'm like, sure. He said, you can breed to him anytime you want. I'm like, sure. At that point, he had shown the dog, but wasn't winning consistently. Because he wasn't mature. He was a skinny, tall dog. At, you know, he's a puppy. Now he was an adult. You know, 16, 17 months old. He muscled out. He, he, he was incredible. So he, would, he talked me into keeping, placing the dogs out. He said, I'll help place them out with people. And we'll keep track of them. And we'll have, we will have breeding rights to all of them. So it worked out with three of them. The other two people spayed them, but it's no big deal. Well, that litter changed everything. And I told them, don't show the dogs to anybody. Let's just see how they turn out. Well, they turned out, man. <laughs> they, they were bully, tight muscled, ripped, incredible structure. And because of the black color, you could see every fiber, all the definition, all that. And uh, it changed, it really did change the game because after one of them was called Huggy, he wasn't ever shown or anything, but his sister Gracie was shown and she was uh, first black bully champion. They had black standard champions, but they never had a black bully champion. And she was the first. And then later, Huggy was bred to one of my females, uh, Juanita, and uh, produced this dog called Gaucho. And Gaucho was a spitting image of his dad, just a little bit bigger. And Gaucho became the first black male bully champion, American Bulldog. And uh, that whole vibe, which it, it met with a lot of resistance from these bully people, because you get competitive breeders, and if there's anything they can talk crap about, they will, just to knock you. But it didn't matter because... Next thing you know, everybody's aiming for these black dogs. So the history of the black dogs in American Bulldogs, like I said, uh, Scott had a dog called Dixie Blackjack. If you look at the original standard that was written, it's listed solid black, solid brindle. They had listed in the, in the standard Johnson and Scott wrote the original one, black. Not black brindle. They, they listed brindle separate. and. Alan Scott to this day has black dogs and he'll even tell you, yeah, there's always been black dogs. They weren't, they weren't, you know, the most popular, but they, they were around. <clears throat> so there's basically, I don't know, three, three or four basic strains in the bully dogs. There was a guy back in the eighties called James Ellerby, really nice guy from Philadelphia. He lived in Philadelphia. He orig originally he was from, either South or North Carolina. I can't remember. He told me a story of when he was a kid. Um, he was kind of like me, crazy about dogs. And he said in his little town, there were these American bulldog type dogs. He just called them white bulldogs. And uh, he said the guy lived across the street, owned a turkey farm. <laughs> he said he had a dog called Brock. And he always wanted one of them, but his dad, they were poor. And his dad said, we can't afford to buy those. He said they sold them like at the general store. The guy that owned the general store bred them every once in a while. And he had one in the store running loose. So his dad died and his mother packed up the kids and they moved to Philadelphia. 
where her family lived. And uh, this James Ellerby originally hooked up with uh, David Levitt, and he had some Levitt oldies, or, or, or early, early dogs. And uh, he went over to Dave Levitt's one day and saw this American Bulldog. It was one of the Johnson dogs that Dave Levitt had, was leasing. And he's like, oh, my God, that's the bulldog of my youth when I was a kid. I've been looking for those for years. I can't find any. I've sent money back to my family, and nobody can find them. And he said, oh, I got him. This is from John D. Johnson. It's an American bulldog, blah, blah, blah. So meanwhile, Ellerby had a female from Dave Levitt and Bredder. And uh, he was an older, uh, older black guy. Grew up in the country, pragmatic type person. His female started going into labor on a Thursday. And he didn't get paid till Friday. And I guess she was having trouble. And Friday he went and cashed his check and came home. And if she hadn't had puppies, he was going to take her to the vet. Well, she was dead. And Dave Levitt flipped out and took all of his dogs back. I think he had another two dogs from and said, you know, Promise me you'll never breed another dog ever again. You should have called me. I would have done this or that, whatever. There was, so, there was a disagreement, and he got out of the old English Bulldogs, which really wasn't even a breed yet. It was just starting. So he remembered Johnson. He contacted Mr. Johnson and bought dogs from him. He had a famous dog called uh, – we had a female called Sugardow, I think, six. So she was one or two generations from that English Bulldog. And then he bought a dog that was called King's Bruiser Bow the Sixth, and that dog was from this King Bruiser Bow the Fourth, who was that dog Mr. Johnson had the big famous collar from, and said he was 170 pounds. And so he had those dogs, and James Ellerby tell or Mr. Johnson told me this. Je- Ellerby didn't, but he said that he always wanted a black bulldog. Well, James Ellerby was at I don't know if he was at a, a dog fight or there was something going on. He lived in the hood in Philadelphia. And uh, anyway, there was a female that I guess lost the fight. And I guess they were going to put her down. She was a black female. And he said, or they told him he, she was Labrador and uh, Pitbull. And uh, he said, no, no, I'll take her. So he brought her home, fixed her all up called Mr. Johnson and said, I want to breed this dog in. Because he asked Mr. Johnson, how do I do that? And Mr. Johnson's like, you got to find somebody who's got a black bulldog. So they did. They bred that dog. Her name was Champagne. And uh, Mr. Johnson called at the time they used the ARF. He called the ARF and said, James Ellerby's going to use this black dog and give him papers. So they registered them right away. You know, as American, you know, pure American bulldogs or whatever, registered American bulldogs. So, some of the people that have used that blood say it wasn't a, oh no, couldn't be a Labrador pit bull. It was probably a Neo that would make more sense, which it, it could. You never, I mean, who knows? So, that guy produced him for a while. He told me that uh, he said, I kept getting white. He, he had the opposite of what I did. He said, I kept getting white. They kept going back to white. <clears throat> so, the the dogs he had didn't the black dogs didn't really catch on or but there was a guy that that had uh some pretty pivotal dogs from mr johnson called david farnetti he had a dog called dozer bruno he was a big white 125 pound dog and a female called ruby who was a smaller white and black brindle dog and he wanted to try uh he knew james ellaby and he they were friends and um he decided he wanted to try to use one of James Ellerby. No, he bought a dog from James Ellerby called Muscles. And Muscles was down from Cham- from Champagne. And uh, a Johnson dog he, he produced called Muscles. So he had Muscles too. That's right. So that dog grew up. He got him the same similar time that he got Dozer. And Dozer was a big, thick, 125-pound monster with a giant head. And this other dog, Muscles, was a tall, rangy, kind of standardish looking dog. But uh, Dave Farnetti now says that that dog had a much better temperament than Dozer. So anyway, he had that. He did use the dog a little bit. So there's some of that blood out there. 
Uh, there's a breeder that's been around even a little bit longer than me called Doug Kennedy in Michigan. And Doug bought his first American Bulldog from James Ellerby, and it was a black bitch he called Black Mamba. So she was like three quarters Johnson, one quarter Champagne. And she was black, bodysuit, and he, he used her basically to start his kennel. But just like me, early on when he got the black dogs, he didn't advertise them. He just sold them local. He didn't give papers. He even produced a blue dog years ago. I forget what her name was, but I don't even know if he sold her to a, a breeder or who he sold her to. So Kennedy had always been getting black dogs from that strain. Uh, that guy, Aslan, the guy that had Aslan, I told you how he came about. I don't know what he was, how much uh, English bulldog or how much uh, American bulldog and who knows what else. But he was black and white, good looking dog, superior working dog. He, he, they used him on man work and on hogs. And so he was just an exceptional dog. So the black from Aslan is where my black came from. Then in the standard dogs, there was a guy called Ray Weaver. And he had performance type painter type American bulldogs. And he uh, bought a dog from uh, Floyd Bougeau caught from Maverick, from champion Maverick. Her name is Zydeco Dancer. And uh, she was a black pit. And some of those Eli pits are a little bit bigger. So she was, I imagine she was probably 50 pounds if she was really big. So he talked to this guy, John Lickhart, who had those Bama boy standard performance painter type dogs. He had a dog called felony that he thought was really a good dog. So they bred those two together. And now he, they didn't keep it a secret. Uh, at that time there was a, uh, there was a registry at the NKC had a deal where they called it the seven eighths rule. So you could breed out cross your dogs, but it would only be registered once it got to seven eighths. So they registered their dogs through the seven eighths rule, even, even doing that. And even in the standard dogs, which are, holy shit, there's, there's, they've been out cross to pit bull a lot, you know, admitted to and not admitted to. So, but they, because the dogs were black, I don't know, you know, people get weird. They get jealous or they, they, see somebody getting attention and they don't like that because their dogs are not getting attention. So they talk shit. So that's a third strain. So since those three came out, uh, in the standard dogs, they just, that guy just bred here and there. They, they weren't really popular, but they existed. And he was pretty vocal and out there. He, he wasn't hiding the dogs, but in the bully dogs, uh, until I got, that Aslan great granddaughter and bred her into my stuff and started producing black. And because I had that man of war blood, I guess I started producing heavy, heavy black color. Uh, you know, and like I said, I kept it Taz. I didn't advertise Taz. I didn't show them to a lot of people. Then I had this daughter bonsai. I didn't show her cause she wasn't a very impressive dog. She was black and had the best temperament, but and she breathed incredible. That was the big thing. I was trying to clean up the breathing. And then I produced Manila, who was a decent looking dog and her breathing was good. But when she produced that litter with DMJ and, and people saw Huggy and Gracie and another big red dog, it was in that litter called Butters. I mean, they were no, uh, nobody would say, Oh, those were dogs were garbage. You know, they were, superior structure muscle they're just they're physically arresting looking dogs and that started this whole black bully craze a lot of people knocked them at first and now they're breeding the shit out of them uh, so doug kennedy started thinking hey i've been producing black bulldogs i just haven't really sold them so then he started selecting more and producing more black and uh there's a guy in california that crossed R2 bred gaucho to one of these dogs down from some black, a little bit of black uh, Kennedy dogs. And nowadays, uh, black American bulldogs are very popular. And now it's come full circle. There, there was a guy that took uh, uh, the black American, standard American bulldogs that came from the Ray Weaver cross 
he sent uh, Don Matthews produced the dog off of that. He uses those that strain and uh, sent it to a guy in the Netherlands, and that guy bred it to this pretty famous, maybe one of the most famous or well used studs in the bully side, a dog called Fifty Cent Mega Bulls Fifty. Uh, they bred those two together, and this guy has a kennel called uh, Bull Spirit. Bull Spirit. There's a dog, and he that guy got some a gaucho daughter, and so he he's he's got all all the black strings in his dogs. He had a dog called Black Jesus, or is he if he's still alive, that's pretty nice. And uh, so the black dogs came about pretty much like that. That's the true history. That's no. They weren't a pit bull cross that uh, I did or anybody did. This Ellerbee's dog was from the 90s, you know, 80s, 90s. And we don't know what the hell that dog was. It probably was pit bull cross with something. They said Labrador. Other people say no, it had to be a Neo. Regardless, uh, you know, and then a lot of people use that. Oh, those dogs aren't pure, you know. And meanwhile, they have these big Johnson-y bully type dogs that uh, would fall over on a walk on a hot day like today. And uh, those dogs are so pure, you know, but the, a dog that can actually do the job the breed was designed for, that's not pure because seven, eight, ten generations back, there was something different crossed in. <clears throat> so that's kind of the state of the American Bulldog and the black dogs. Since then, what's happened is the Johnson dogs always threw that dilute gene. They, you know, he, he didn't have solid black, but he had black brindle and he produced blue fawns and uh, blue brindles. So that gene floats around. So uh, it was inevitable that if you line that up on both sides and then throw a black dog in the mix, uh, you're going to get blue. So now people get blue. It's not, you know, it's not like in the pit bulls. Everybody just breeds, you know, for a long time there, the, the blue dog was the thing. But we produce them here and there. And then because the red nose in American Bulldog's been around forever, when you get that on both sides, parents, you know, get two carriers, and then you have one of the dogs be black, you can produce chocolate. And that's controversial, too. A lot of people don't understand color genetics and like, oh, my God. The first one I ever produced, I wasn't looking to produce it. It just was lined up. <clears throat> and I was keeping them for myself. And this guy from France called and said his wife loves the dog and named my price. I named my price. And he took the dog. And then when he got the dog, everybody started saying, oh, that Vito's putting a chocolate lab in there, you know. But you can't, you can't just take a chocolate dog and cross it to a dog that doesn't carry the liver red nose gene and produce chocolate. You won't get it. You got to have it all. You got to have that dilute on both sides. So now we have chocolate. And then in the rear case, you get the blue dilute and the chocolate lined up. You produce lilac. <clears throat> and there's a few lilac dogs. And honestly, the color dogs, the black, the blues, all, there's guys that their whole kennel, everything's set up purely on color and bully type, you know. And yes, they produce dogs that suck, I'm sure. You know, they're beautiful dogs, but they, they're they breeding them on the color and on the bully look. And then you got people that are outraged about that, which... It's kind of silly because, like I said, 80% of the dogs produced are these extreme bully dogs, and uh, they're bred completely on cosmetics. They're bred on not maybe not the color. They might be white, but they're still um, extreme features that aren't healthy and aren't dogs that can handle the heat. So who's worse, the guy that's doing it like that and producing a funky color? or the guy that's producing a white dog that sucks like that. It, both of them suck. So it's just politics, the way the breed is. You know, that's basically where the black American bulldog came from. <clears throat> They're not a recent mix. They're um, something that was added, not really documented, and not really known factually. 
I'm sure maybe there's somebody out there that's crossed. I mean, who knows? People can do all kinds of stuff. I know people have gotten caught <clears throat> crossing in those uh, oldie type dogs that carry blue. And now we're starting to see, I haven't really paid too close of attention, but I think it's happened like four or five times. These bully people produced, uh, are producing tri-colored dogs. Tri, you know, like a, like a American bully, you know, how they produce tri and some of the old English bulldogs will produce a tri dog with points that has a little bit of white. So they're popping up. And, uh, and I've studied two, two of the different people that have done, I've looked at the pedigree. And like I said, to do that, you have to, both parents have to carry tri, the tri gene. They have to carry the chocolate gene. And if you want blue, they got to carry the blue dilute gene. I mean, you can get that all in one dog, but I don't think anybody's produced it yet I, that I know, but they produce chocolate tri and black tries. And uh, so that's evidence that something was crossed in because, and, and I don't know if they did it on purpose or if it just lined up. But like I said, you got to have those carriers on both sides. <clears throat> I mean, there's a possibility that a coon hound got crossed in a million years ago and the gene just popped up. But that's pretty... The, the odds of that are, you, you know, like winning the lottery, that you line up two dogs that have that gene. Because, like I said, it can be floating around, you know, but it, it, one dog carries it, it won't express itself. It's got it's got to be on both sides. So that is the state of the colored dogs. I'm, I'm, and then I've heard, I've never seen one, but I've heard people bitching about uh, Merle. Oh, the, they're getting Merle dogs. I've never seen one. I've never ever seen one. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but yeah, I've, I've, they're, I've they're never seen a Merle. They're trying to put Merle into everything now. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's cool looking, but it carries its own problems. <clears throat> I mean, I think American Bulldogs have Catahoula probably way back, just because Catahoulas are often used as bay dogs, and they're also uh, there was a whole big thing. Some people you know, years and years ago, loved to cross the Catahoula to, to Bulldogs, whether it's American Bulldog or Pitbull, they call them Catahoula Bulldogs. They made good catch dogs and uh, just general purpose working dogs. So I can see that, but uh, I, I've never seen it. I've never had, you know, I've seen, you know, pictures of people's tricolor are you dogs familiar with, on the um, internet. Are you familiar with the working pit bulldog? Yeah, kind of. There's a guy, he's a friend of mine, lives in Alaska, that he was uh, pretty well known for his American Bulldog, Screaming Eagle. Uh, him and his partner had the Screaming Eagle dogs, which were American Bulldogs, way back when. And then they kind of got out of it. And um, then they showed back up and they were talking about, well, they're like, you know, I loved our American Bulldogs, but these pit bulls we got are just as good. I'm looking at the pit bulls. I'm like, they're beautiful dogs, beautiful, like 75, 80 pound dogs, 90 pound dogs. And I'm like, what the hell, what are those? So I looked at the, some of the pedigrees. They go back a little bit to the watchdog. They go back a little bit to the whopper pits, you know, and the whopper pit was basically came from a guy called Eddie Eddington. Eddie Eddington was like the guru of weight pull in pit bulls. He, he was a superstar of weight pull. He pretty much uh, advanced it more than anybody else. And the ADBA loved him. He was a great guy. He actually got murdered. Um, I don't know if it was for the dogs or what, but somebody killed him. Um, coming that looked at his dogs for some, some reason. I don't know. But anyway, he, he was in Oklahoma. And there was a guy early on. Um, in Oklahoma called John Blackwell. And John Blackwell was a guy that had bred Amstaffs and bred English Mastiffs and bred Doggy Bordeaux. And the breed that he had before he got into American Bulldogs was Doggy Bordeaux. And he, he claimed he had two females <clears throat> that didn't, he could never get pregnant. So he was doing an American Bulldog breeding and he, he was, uh, got this stud from Mr. Johnson called Dick the Bruiser the Second. 
And so they went and got uh, Dick the Bruiser the second, and he said, I just wanted to see, and he bred him to the two doggy Bordeaux females. Matter of fact, the picture, there's pictures of the pups, and one of the, I don't know, I don't think it was a Carl Semensic book. It was some other book I had. And it shows pictures, glossy, beautiful pictures of a, a half-American bulldog, doggy Bordeaux, that look, looks like an American bulldog, right next to an all-red, red-nose type looking doggy Bordeaux. Well, anyway, that produced this jimongous brindled dog with a black mask called Whopper. I forget. I don't know how big Whopper was. He was maybe 130 pounds. Didn't look like a pit bull. Looked like a bull mastiff or something. And uh, Eddie Eddington got him because he wanted to use him to compete in the bigger, higher wor working uh, weight pull classes. You know, you pull against uh, the big breeds. And so then he started breeding them together. And then ADBA, I guess, registered him. And so those dogs kind of, those Whopper pits started really dominating. And um, so that kind of went into all that stuff. And I guess it sparked all this other stuff with dagger pits and with uh, Camelot. You know, basically they crossed in Doggy Bordeaux or some big dog. And then you had the XL dogs, I guess, what they, who knows what they put in their English mask. <laughs> Pressa, I know one guy got caught putting a Pressa in. Yeah, I remember and, uh, that. Yeah. So, so John, like I said, John Blackwell did that breeding, and he kept stuff. He kept stuff. I know that he kept some stuff off of it because all of a sudden he had this. He had a dog that was placed near him uh, called Tug, and Tug was 154 pounds. They said, and he looked it. He was a white dog with a brindle saddle, and that worked its way into Mister Johnson's stuff through a dog called, uh, well, there was two dogs, a female called Bridget, and then another dog called, uh, he, he called Dick the Bruiser the third, Buster. Buster was a pretty cool dog, like 130 pound I saw him in person. He got him because a guy called Andrew Robinson bought him from, from, uh, uh, from John Blackwell. And, uh, the dog, was a big drivey ass dog. Well, Andrew Robinson had these staffy bulls and he had this house with a big porch and the porch didn't have any railings on it. And he had a big tree limb that hung close to the porch and he hung a spring pole on it. And uh, the freaking staffy bulls would run, launch themselves off the porch and hang from that rope. Well, Buster wanted to do that too. And when he did it one day, it, the rope broke. He landed on his hip. And it broke or fractured his hip socket. He called Mr. Johnson. He said, man, this is going to cost a ton of money to fix this dog. I don't have the money. If you want to, ha if you fix him, you can have him. So Mr. Johnson had him surgery all done up. Dog had a cast. First time I saw him, he had a big cast on his back leg. And uh, that dog turned out to be an excellent stud for him. And he bred the crap out of that dog. And uh, he, he was a cool dog. He was white with the most incredible, like, mahogany brindle saddle. He was Dick the Bruiser the third. Now, that dog went back. I think that dog was probably a third, uh, a fourth or an eighth dog de Bordeaux. And uh, Johnson had another one that came down from his sister, this dog called Bridget. Somebody bred to one of his dogs, Bridget to one of his dogs, and he got this dog, oh, he bred to Elrod, and he got this dog called Elrod Jr., he was also a really nice looking dog, red nose, red brindle dog. He used him for a while too. So <clears throat> the bulldog world, the dog breeding world is strange. Shit happens. And now, and now it's funny because they have these DNA tests and they claim 90% uh, accuracy, which is not true because I've looked into it and it, there's never been a scientific peer-reviewed study done on the claim of ancestry and dogs, you know, where they say the breed profile, they, they're selling the shit out of them right now where they're telling people your dog is 80% American bulldog. Your dog's, you know, 50% American bulldog. There's, there are a big brouhaha right now is there's a kennel uh, and a club that's trying to get the American bulldogs AKC recognized. And uh, supposedly that guy did all of his dogs and 
at one time the best he'd gotten was like 50 or 60 percent american bulldog you're talking um, which is silly bruce uh it's bruce silly because, yeah. yeah yeah a lot of people are talking crap about that and i'm like hey the guy's being honest and that is not an absolute test right. that is they developed yeah i got, I got a few a really uh, cool i got style. a few interviews with him he's a pretty cool guy um yeah, yeah he told me the whole story it's about it and it's a, it's it's pretty wacky man and the, the funny thing was is he was explaining how he was getting results it'll be all the same litter we're talking litter mates all tested and they would all have different percentages yeah because they're looking at uh abstract stuff a dog has almost 3 billion genes. Humans do too. They almost have 3 billion genes. When they do those breed profiles, they look at a fraction of a set of genes and they develop a profile. Well, especially in American Bulldogs, like just listening to me talk about the history, our gene pool is odd. You know, if nobody's ever DNA tested a man of war dog that has really zero relationship to Johnson or Scott, or any of the other combinations out there, uh, they're going to have a different profile. You know, and a lot of the 100% Johnson people are like, well, I haven't seen a profile with St. Bernard, which I I've seen a, I've seen a profile with St. Bernard. The people told me do not show anybody, you know, so I'm just not showing anybody. But they had 12.5% St. Bernard in a Johnson type dog. But that doesn't really mean anything because the stuff that they're talking about is you got to understand those people are making money selling this thing it's going like hotcakes everybody's buying 167 bucks a test and they're they're good tests because they have some dna stuff they can tell you <clears throat> but as far as the percentage of purity it's nonsense it's it's not pure nonsense but it's uh, i will take for instance i've done the human grade stuff. I've done, you know, I don't know, 10 years ago, my parents are both from Sicily. And I thought it would be interesting to get my ancestry at ancestry.com. I sent it in. And back then, 10 years ago, when I did it, it came back, I was 72% Greek Italian. Greek Italian, they, that, that was a classification. And then I had all kinds of stuff. I'm like 2% North African. I had some Irish, some British, a lot of uh, Swedish and stuff from all over, which it could be. I mean, uh, you know, that's how the world, that's how especially Europe is. It was kind of a melting pot. But my point is today they update, they get more and more and more in their database. And now they send a thing that said, oh, now you're 97.8% Italian. So I looked into all that stuff because I thought this doesn't make sense. And, it, and if you got litter mates and brothers and sisters come back different too, because they're looking they're not it's not exact science. They're looking at combinations of markers. Well, you know, as well as I do, Great Danes and English Mastiffs and all those dogs, they're related. They all came pit bull and a freaking American bulldog. They're related. They came from the same branch of the dog genome the same family so and you're just looking at a minute tiny 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 thing and you're determining because all these different dogs share that combination that they're that it's an exact science well they have never studied it in dogs but they've done it peer-reviewed studies done scientific studies that have been published they there is one one that i know of in humans and they determined you know and it's a guessing game for them too that those tests are at best about 50 to 60 percent 50 to 60 percent dude i can flip a coin and do that they they found it out especially too because there's a huge industry for african-american ancestry and there's been people that have, they've submitted their test, the same person submitted ex several tests to the same company and to all the other different companies. They all come back because uh, a lot of African-Americans want to know, hey, where, where in Africa am I from? So they, they have all these different results. So they did the study and found that it's not that accurate. 
I mean, it might be more in the future. And there is a degree. I'm sure that it is to a degree. But like even in American Bulldogs, a lot of the, the database that they started with, which is where they based the profile from, was because uh, there was a dog called uh, Boyd's Malecki, who, for some reason, she, and she's the only one I've ever heard of that throws this, she threw this weird disorder called uh, NCL. It's uh, a thing that the dog reaches a certain age, and it's almost like they got nerve damage. They, their rear legs, it almost looks like hip dysplasia, but it's not. So that's one of the first things they developed a genetic test to try to figure out in American Bulldogs. So all these people that have all these dogs down from Malecki, because Malecki was a good producer and she produced a lot of real uh, well-known dogs, this dog Koa, this dog called Matias. So everybody had this blood and those people wanted to, you know, you want to know, breed that out. So they started developing a test. So all the, all the database early on that, they base all these uh, breed profiles on comes from that dog. Well, that dog is, her pedigree is like so shallow. Her grandma or her mother or her grandma was the dog that this guy called Jay Dorsey, it's a Jay Dorsey hunting lodge in South Carolina, I think it is. He bought her off a front porch from a black lady that said she's, she's a stupid dog that keeps killing her chickens. And, and he took her and used her as a catch dog at his uh, trophy hunting outfit, and she was fantastic. And then Bill Heinz bought her and bred her, and she produced fantastic. But she didn't have a pedigree. Nobody knows what the hell she was. And uh, that's probably where the first part of all this happened. You know, I guess if they, if they DNA tested every American bulldog for 20 years, and that database is probably a whole lot better than what they have now. But that's not the case. So to tell somebody, your dog is uh, 50% American Bulldog and the other 50% is this, that's nonsense. And it's, I think it's dangerous because if you have a good dog, a good American Bulldog, he, he breathes good. He could hunt. He could do everything. He's got an excellent temperament. And then he comes back 50%. And now, all of a sudden, he's not pure. He's not a good dog. That is the opposite of what makes great dogs. You know how great pit men were, they have sayings, you know, a good dog is where you find it. That kind of speaks to that. So when you start using some unfaulty test to determine purity, just like a dog show, just like these stupid dog shows, you got dogs that, you know, they're putting them in an air-conditioned van and pulling them out right when the, the class starts and then throwing them in the van again because they can't, they get too hot if they, if they had to be like a regular dog. And that, so that dog is a champion and all of a sudden everybody wants to breed to it. And it's really, it's a turd. It's not a good dog. <laughs> so, <laughs> I would say it's a lot of fun, but don't put, don't select dogs on that test. That's nonsense. Because if they're determining parentage, ancestry, and you have two dog litter mates and one's 50% and one's 100%, what the hell? And I have people argue with me forever and say, you don't understand. That, that dog inherited those genes. That dog inherited the pure genes. The other dog didn't. It's like, no, buddy, your grandpa is your grandpa. It doesn't matter what the genes, how the roulette wheel folds up. Your grandpa is who it is. If your grandpa is a beagle, you're 25% beagle, dude. It doesn't matter what that test says. That test is not exact science. So forget about that stupid test and start looking at the dog. It's just, you know, and it's a big money thing. They're selling the crap out of that stuff. You can't get on the internet without seeing it. You can't go to the vet without them pushing it. And for people that have mutts, you know, it's kind of a fun thing. Early on when they did them, it was obvious. But well, I've seen people, there was somebody that put up a, a result from Embark on a dog, and it said it was 100% American Bulldog. When you saw the picture of the dog, it had long hair, and it looked like a, a King Charles, a giant King Charles Spaniel. So I'm like, I mean, maybe the dog was 100% American Bulldog, but it it's expressing genes from something back there. And that sure as hell isn't a hundred percent dog. I'd, 
you wouldn't want to breed to that dog. So it, it's, that I think is a scary thing. I, I see people saying, well, we're going to breed, we're going to use this as a test to select breeding stock. It's like, oh my God, throw you wipe your butt with that test. That doesn't mean anything. I, you know, there's a guy, I, I read a quote from a guy, he's a working dog guy. He's had American Bulldogs. And he said something, I thought, wow, that's freaking so profound. He said something to the effect of, I'd rather have a dog that is a perfect working dog, acts and, and can do the work, that has 25% Labrador. To me, that's more of a bulldog than a dog that's 100% and can't do it. Which is, like I said, that's how dogs were bred. That's how great breeds came about. That's how you have pointers that at eight weeks will point that's how you have labradors that are just incredible swimmers you know that's how you have these dogs it's not because of the cosmetic it's not because of some subjective beauty contest it's not about a dna result from some some company that's making millions of dollars selling this fallacy it's about the dog I don't know what's good. I don't know what's going to happen because our society, we're wired for looks. I mean, there's been studies that shown that women uh, treat pretty babies better than they do <laughs> ugly babies. I hate to say that it sounds horrible, but they've done a study that kind of showed it's true to a point. So we're a visual creature, you know, and it's hard. It's going to be hard. And, and now I think, too, uh, uh, maybe because I'm an old guy, I'm like, I never thought I'd be the old guy that said these young kids nowadays. But these young kids nowadays are freaking me out, man. They, the American bully scene, you know, I watched some of that. Yeah, you know, I see some really cool, like those Razor's Edge dogs. Some of them are just really cool looking dogs. Okay, they're not a pit bull, but they are cool. And they, they're, they're fine. They're healthy. They're there's something. Yeah, but I mean, I say more, more or less back when it started. Um, I it, it just went, it just went so far left since then that it, it's not, it's not the same dog anymore. When I when I first got into dogs, um, that's what was popular at the time was you know the Gotti line and the Razor's Edge, and they still. Honestly, they acted more like an American Bulldog. Um, They're friendly, but, um, you know, they would bite an intruder. I had a Razor's Edge dog that was um, given to me because the dog, it was from uh, Dozer Daisy. He was from Dozer Daisy, which I guess early on was kind of a famous thing. Uh, his name was 50, and he was blue. He was undershot had a very thick bully head. He would be considered a pocket because he, he was small. I, I used him because I, I, in, a, in 1999, I started my own little oldies. It, it, it's pretty much fizzled out. I, I just don't have the passion for it anymore, but I call them Alu bulls. So I was going to use them. I did a couple breedings, but the reason why I got him was because the guy's like, I'm the only one that can mess with him because when you put him in a crate, he if he doesn't know you, he, he goes ape shit. And if you put him behind a, a gate, he acts so aggressive, like he would bite a stranger, anybody who walks up. And he's like, oh, I think it's because this guy made him that way. But I, it, no, that was genetic. And uh, it's so weird. The guy handed me the leash. And the minute he handed me the leash, the, guy, the dog looked at me like, okay, you're the leader now. You're my buddy. He loved me. He was a cute dog, too. He was like a pocket. He was like... I think he was 16 inches tall, maybe 15 inches tall, and just thick as shit. And he had a little tail, <laughs> a little short tail that looked like a lightning rod. And so anyway, I had him for a while, and I was like, oh, I understand this dog. I see this in American, Johnson American Bulldogs sometimes. When they're behind, like when they're in a crate or behind a fence, they're fucking crazy. They're crazy. They, they are aggressive. Like they get really aggressive. And but when you walk in the yard or something, then they're fine. So that's kind of how he was. And 
this guy called me back like six or eight months later and said, I broke up with that girl. Can I have my dog back? I'm like, yes, please. <laughs> Thank him. He's crazy. I read him once and he produced a dog. Uh, he was a thick, looked like a, a, a pocket type dog. He was bred to my old English bulldog female. There was my, my line was basically staffy bull English and American. And so my dogs were small. I tried to produce them like 15 inches tall. They kind of had a bully head, but not exaggerated. And they're kind of athletic build, like a staffy bull. So anyway, I produced this dog. I called him a uh, fat, fat F word. And uh, he was crazy. I had, you know, I put him with a friend. He was socialized and everything. But he did the same thing his dad did. I was like, God, it, it is a genetic thing. But I've never heard of this. I've never heard of uh Razor's Edge dogs acting like that, but I even went to a. Sh- well, back I when, went- uh, back when I had the cross, I had a, uh, I had a, it was a Gotti line Razor's Edge cross dog, and um, but he just he looked more like. This is back when they looked like, you know, more your pit bull Amstaff look like they didn't, they weren't so thick. Um, he had a blockier head. He had bigger shoulders and everything. But he was still, I would I would classify his body type and his head type and everything as as more of a uh, an athletic Amstaff. But um, he would he would bite for oh, yeah. sure. Those dogs. I mean, that's. But I mean, I that's a I high like percentage them. of pit bull. Even the Amstaffs, they're not game or maybe as game or, or the same way they've been bred for shows. But they're still the same functional root of dogs that came from Ireland and now made the American pit bull. I went to a show. I've been to a couple of American bully shows, which I think are, are very interesting. I think, I think it's because I'm not a dog show guy anymore. I never really was. I judged a lot of dog shows. Uh, and, but the American bully shows are a trip. I went to one here in St. Louis. Um, I walk in, I was with a friend that wasn't a dog person. I walk in, I'm looking around, I'm like, I'm just freaking out. I'm like, what the hell is going on? They got all this, like a trade show, and which was kind of cool. And they had velvet ropes and some people were putting their dogs up on these little boxes. And I'm looking at the dogs, I'm like, that, that, that dog's got a lot of English bulldog in it. I see some that I thought, that dog might have some bass out in it. <laughs> and they're in the show ring. A lot of dogs in there too, and they're selling T-shirts and hip hop music's playing, and I thought, well, this is kind of cool, man. I mean, this is different. And I was walking around. I had somebody yelling, "Vito, Vito!" I'm like, "Who the hell knows me here?" So this guy who's a trainer in St. Louis, uh, Jermaine, he comes up to me and says, "Man, uh, you stuck out like a sore thumb." I'm like, "What? Why would you say that?" He goes, "You're the only guy here with dad shorts on." <laughs> I had shorts that were like above my knee and, you know, I had gym clothes on and I I guess I looked very odd with all these kids that had like these big, I don't know what you call them, big blue jean shorts that go down to their ankles. But I thought it was interesting. And I actually, I see some, I see what people like and a lot of the dogs, you know, I saw that. I think it started going south when when he got that dog Miyagi and uh, what was the other one, Dax. And I can see they look beautiful from the front. And then I've seen pictures of them from the side. And their ass is like two inches higher than their head. <laughs> and I'm like, what can that be? They, that's this is just no way. Those came from Amstaff and Pitbull. There's no way. It could never happen. It has to be Frenchy and. Yeah, it just it's just a, a train wreck all the way around. I'm so, um, uh, quite frankly, I'm so disappointed by the by the American bully game. There's still some uh, there's still some XL camps out there. Oh yeah, that produce like some some nice the, dogs. I, there's that a still dog work. XL video uh, of, and I thought, wow, I really like that dog, King uh, King Liger, King Liger. <laughs> There's a video of him running yeah, around this front yeah. yard. They claimed he was like 150. He was big. But I just loved his attitude. He was just been yeah. bouncing around, acting a fool. Big, beautiful dog. <clears throat> so, hey, I understand. I know that the, now <clears throat> those, what do they call them, American pit bull dogs? Oh, the working pit bull dog, yeah. Working pit bull I guess bull the, uh, the ADBA um, 
started registering those in 2015, I believe. Yeah, yeah. My you know, friend, I personally Mark. like them. Uh, th those are, I think that's the direction. Because once upon a time, a lot of the, you know, before they were even called American Bullies, a lot of those old crosses looked like that. They were, uh, they just looked like larger, slightly thicker game dogs. And that's that's more my flavor of dog just um that's why i like you know the the you know working type uh, american bulldogs um because i i just like that look of a dog and, and when a, you know a lot of people say um like how the scott type just looks like a larger pit bull um because of the longer muzzle it's the it's body it's frame and everything i like that i like that look of a dog personally because um basically what you were talking about earlier my fear is um you know having having the dog out in the elements and uh and the dog being able to survive yeah it's funny if you went back 100 150 years ago and brought people to the future and heard they heard us talking about dogs that can't breathe and can't live outside they'd be scratching their head like what the hell well, where the hell do they live because they didn't have air conditioning back then. Everybody lived in a house that didn't have air conditioning or outside. So uh, for a dog that can't live outside, come on, are you crazy? But that's what worries me, because when I look at the whole American bully thing and just kids, younger guys in general now, when I was a kid, there was so much these macho breeds. You know, you had Dobermans, Pitbulls, Rottweilers, and nobody, so nobody was enamored with those dogs because they were just funky looking freaks, you know, weird looking cartoon characters. They liked them because, man, this Rottweiler, this dude, he's the real deal. You know, he's physically un, un, amazing or a Doberman or a pit bull that it was about doing something, you know, having a, a, something that related to their history of being a working dog you know that there was whole groups of guys that would look at a dog and like damn damn he's nice now i'm afraid because i see these kids are like yo dude fam <laughs> look at this and they got this dog that it's the most bizarre looking thing i've ever seen like it looks like its front legs are grown out of its neck and it's like what in the hell is this thing yeah, I mean, it. I they can't expect something like that to be able to protect them or their house. I mean... Oh, I mean, even if you're talking about a novelty breed, you know, English Bulldogs, I see it. They're cute, you know. You got to keep them on an air conditioner vent all day and watch they don't go outside in the heat for more than 10 seconds and all that stuff. And you might have a list of medications you give them and you may have to have surgery on his eyelids and all this stuff. I understand, you know, people think they're cute and that but some of these exotic american bullies and just I, I it's just weird to see young guys enamored with basically uh an invalid uh a handicapped yeah. freak weird dog you know yeah it's sad it's really sad no you know, i said if I, if, maybe i said if i wanted something cute i'd get like a, a patterdale at least a yeah. patterdale could still do something you know Oh, they're obnoxious as hell. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I can even, I see some of these little dogs, these little American bullies that are like little, like Miyagi stuff, kind of like they're so tight and muscled and they're just cute little looking dogs. And I can understand that maybe, but I, I've seen the last 10 years, I've seen some stuff that's like, what the hell? What are you thinking? I used to... In American Bulldogs, I used to worry a lot more about it too because they there's there was some really funky stuff out there that really got popular. But I've learned too that uh, in American Bulldogs, at least, eventually those dogs they don't if they don't produce healthy or they don't produce fairly well, they die off. Their blood dies off. They're not as popular anymore. It's a learning curve with American Bulldogs. It seems like people get into them, and if they stick around they realize, oh my God, I lost a dog to the heat and this and that. This dog fell over dead inside. You know, I just had a guy that uh, he's a nice guy and 
he's had American Bulldogs, but he had he had more of a hybrid Johnson Scott type dog that didn't have breathing problems, and now he's gotten these high dollar bully American Bulldogs, and he just lost a uh, uh, dog, I guess. I don't know if he paid a lot of money or his partner paid a lot of money for. The dog was in the house. I think the dog's four or five years old. The dog was in the house in air conditioning and died. And he kept saying, what do you, can't be kidding of overheated. I said, well, what happens is when you have these dogs at every breath they take from the time they're two years old and the fat in the back of their throat grows and their trachea uh, is too small to supply their big bulky body with enough oxygen, they get scar tissue on their lungs. They get blisters in their throat because they're constantly, when you hear a dog going 24 seven, its whole life, and it hits five, six years of age, there's damage that's been done to their organs, especially too, because they've been a slightly oxygen depleted and you can't live like that. You know, humans that are sick like that have oxygen that's stuck in their nose. You see old people like that. Well, a bulldog to breathe like that, his there's all kinds of things going on in that body. And yeah, someday he may not have been outside in the heat. He may have gotten stressed or it might have just been his day that his heart was going to give out or whatever. And it's sad. Like I said, I don't know what the guy paid, but I bet he paid, somebody paid four, five, six, seven, maybe $10,000. I don't know for the dog. And I think he lost another dog the same day or one of the other days, but it was at least outside. <laughs> It was at least some reason for that. So uh, it's it's a sad state of affairs, and I, I, I it's turning a little bit. I'd like to think it's because I have a big mouth and talk about it a lot, uh, but I don't think it's turning enough. There's still, I see a lot of ignorance, and unfortunately in dogs, people get in for five years, mess things up, and get out, and, but everybody else is left with the genetics. And then somebody else, another guy starts, and it's like a, a a branch of a tree. It keeps going and going. But like I said, the good thing is the really, really good dogs, the cream rises to the top. And But I worry, like I said, if this new generation of kids are so disconnected with what is a good dog, I don't know. But that's by my age. Everybody, every old guy is like that. This new generation, they're crazy. Well, I mean, for me, and, you know, I'd like to breed, but on a small scale. For me, it's, sure, I want to experiment, and I want healthy dogs, and I'd like to make a little bit of money. But I think with a lot of people today, especially the especially the younger generation, um... They think it's going to be all dollar signs. They think it's going to be all just big money, big money. I'm like, okay, well, there's nothing wrong with producing some some healthy puppies that are going to live a long time and making, you know, fifteen hundred, two thousand bucks, you know, maybe three thousand if if you got, you know, some really high quality stuff. But I notice the more expensive the the dogs are these days, um, just in general, not all across the board. But uh, in general, the more expensive, the higher the price tag, uh, the lower the quality. That, that, that is just what I've noticed. Oh, yeah. Because they got a gimmick or something that sells the dogs. And honestly, the best dogs are usually not that appealing. The best working type dogs don't appeal because they're not extreme in any particular way. So it's like I've talked about it before because I, I've been in this breed so long, I'm I don't know what I'm on, 14 generations, maybe 15. And I put so much of my life and blood, sweat, and tears into these dogs. And it sure as hell wasn't for money. You know, I figured out a long time ago, there's not any money. It's not a steady income. Uh, yeah, you're going to sell a dog here and there for a lot of money, but a puppy. But that's that's the exception, not the rule. Because, you know, the best meme I read was, if you want to be a millionaire in dog breeding, start out as a billionaire. Because if, if you want to do it right, you're going to blow tons of money. So with the, the whole thing with the, the breeding dogs is it's a lot of work. It's messy. Uh, you need some room. And if you're going to really be improving the dog, if that's your really your passion, your goal, you got to be, you got to be, uh, 
heartless in some ways. You got to cull dogs, you, you know, if, if, whether you put them down or you, you find it, find them homes, either way, it's emotionally takes a toll on you. It really does. Sure. I don't know. Well, one other, uh, one, one other point I just thought of, um, when, you know, people approach me because of the, the channel, people approach me constantly. Um, you know, I want a pit bull. What kind of pit bull should I get? And, um, it's funny, 90% of the time and all these inbox messages, they don't even know what a pit bull is and their mind a pit bull they're thinking all these new bully types um when i show them a picture of like say jeep or mayday or you know it, it, you know real pit bull terriers they're like oh no i didn't mean that i'm like well you know that that's a pit bull so yeah they they're immediately they're turned off every time i every time i show the pictures I'm like, so this is what you're saying you want? And I, I don't, well, first off, I don't think you can handle a pit bull. They're like, oh, well, my friend has a pit bull. I was like, well, does it look like this? Oh, no, no, no. It's like, it's like a hundred pounds with a big fat head. I'm like, yeah, that's, it's not a pit bull. Um, so that's, that's, that's one of the biggest ones I run into pretty constantly um, with all the questions I get. It's, yeah, I want a pit bull. It's like, yeah, that's not even a pit bull, my friend. Um, yeah, it's you know in American bulldogs, there there even is a lot of people that can't handle. You know they have they're well meaning, but they can't handle a really tough hard dog. And they, I, I, I in the last ten years, I've had so many problems. I've really concentrated on trying to find good pet homes, even if you know you don't get the big bucks. I I just I just don't like dealing with breeders and show people are crazy. That's all I used to deal with, you know, years ago. And uh, so I get these kids, young people, professionals, whatever. They live in Chicago. They live in New York. They get a dog for me. And I tell everybody the same thing. Look, this isn't a dog park dog. This isn't a doggy daycare dog. You know, maybe for socialization, whether, you know, under five months of age, and you can snatch them up if they get stupid. Uh, okay. But after that, no don't do it. And they don't listen. I get so many calls. Oh my God, those are, oh my God, he ripped my friend's dog's ear off. Or he's, I can't take him to doggy daycare anymore. They kicked this out. And like, I told you, man, this isn't, well, I don't want to leave him home all day all by himself. I'm like, well, what do you think his people do? I mean, dogs sleep 75% of their life. Put them in a crate, and exercise them when you come home and they will fit into your lifestyle trust me and they don't the bulldogs are not designed to be social dog no dog really is designed to go into a kindergarten every day and run around and act like an idiot with a bunch of other dogs so i've had so many i had a guy that just had to put one down and uh, I did an outcross with a, a friend of mine that I think has the best standard dogs in the country, this uh, bullhead dog. And I don't know if he's got, I think he's got the, just a small percentage of these real uh, civil type temperaments uh, that just, they like their family, but they won't take much from any other human. They're, they can be human aggressive. Johnson dogs have been like that. There's a small percentage of them that can be like that too. But he took him to doggy daycare, did all this stuff. He's a big, rough and tough cop. And uh, his dog started biting his dad. He liked everybody. Matter of fact, he's a, they had, his mom had a French bulldog. And uh, so the dog, you know, had to be put down, which freaks me out. But I've had stuff like that happen here and there. Um, and mainly it's just, you know, I had a guy, a same type of thing. I did an outcross, same, same thing, but it was different. It was more the animal aggression. These people swore to me they have a fenced in yard and all that good stuff. Well, it turns out they didn't have a fence. They had a huge yard, they had a cable and the dog would break the cable. And, uh, well, the first time they said they were walking it and some of these pit bull ran out the front yard and attacked their dog. And their dog 
did about $850 worth of damage to the pit bull. And it turned out the guy that owned the dog was a cop, so he was understanding. But then the dog got off the cable line another time and came back all bloody and it killed the cat and did this and that. So I get dogs like that back. I, I've, I got him back. Uh, I found him, actually found him a good home. But uh, so a lot of society, I don't know. I, I mean, it's in my own family. My niece, my nieces have dogs and they treat them like babies, like they're, they're their babies. As a matter of fact, my one niece, her dog is a little Australian shepherd, Lebowski, and uh, the dog sees me and he just freaks out. <laughs> and I'm like, I've never done anything to the dog. I think he just sees and smells my dogs on me and just my posture. He knows I'm totally different than what he's used to and people. I'm not going to yeah. take any shit and uh, I'm dominant. And I'm not going to treat you like a baby. Yeah, so he flips out. I mean, I tried to grab him and pet him and I thought the dog was going to crap himself. So I backed off. So it's just society. I don't know what the deal is, but dogs are not babies to a point. I mean, I understand loving your dog and, you know, sleeping, having them sleep on the couch or seeing your bed. I, I, you know, that's not a problem, but to a point, come on, they, they're not babies and they shouldn't be treated like a baby, but that's the way it is. My, my nephew had a great Dane. And uh, he was telling me that he's taking it to doggy daycare. And I'm like, oh, my God, don't do that. And then he, one day she got Giardia from being there from another dog. And so then he realized, oh, I guess Uncle Vito knows what he's talking about. She's not going back. So it's bizarre. You get old and everybody starts looking like they're crazy at the young generation. But it, it kind of is going on with these dogs. That's why I'm like, I don't know, what's the, what are what are the dogs going to be like in 100 years? Oh, uh, man, I mean, I'm only 33, but uh, I see where you're coming from 100%. Uh, I'm going to be 59 in three weeks, I think. Uh, yeah, four weeks. Yeah, and uh, I already catch myself talking that way. These damn youngsters. <laughs> That's not music. Yeah. But... Yeah, there there are some good guys that are young and, and in the breed just starting out. And I think there's a small percentage of, of guys that have been in it for a little bit and start to realize, hey, you know what? These dogs aren't like the history books say. They can't be walked in the heat. They can't handle the heat. And they, they're starting to see that something needs to be done. And a few there's a few guys out there that have done pretty good out crossing and and selecting and, and producing dogs that are breathing better. So there's some hope, but it's still a huge percentage. Like I said, a huge percentage of the American Bulldogs that are bred are bully type and uh, breathing. And nobody's even being honest about it. You know, you'll hear, I'll hear guys talk on the internet and say, oh, Henny breathes clean. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you're so full of crap. That dog. You know, even if they don't rattle just sitting there, then they have that short of a nose and they're 100 pounds or 90 pounds and they're going to have trouble in the heat. You know, and I've had, you know, when I had really bully dogs, they lived outside. I had dogs that lived outside, but I changed their water twice a day. I made sure they had deep shade. They were under trees. I didn't cut grass in the middle of the day. I wouldn't let a group of people come down and visit in, in a hundred degree day. I tried to keep everybody chill because that's when they die is when they, because these American bulldogs, they're just goofy. They don't, most of them, they don't have a lick of sense. You know, they're gamey and they don't have a lick of sense to sit down when they get hot and chill out. They, they're just bull bullheads they're nutty they just keep going and going and going next thing you know their core temperature is too high and they can't cool themselves and their good is dead unless somebody pulls out a hose and cools them down for 20 minutes and unfortunately that's just a fact anybody that tells you different is uninformed or just purposely lying to you <laughs> I hate to say that, but that's kind of the way it is. And unless things go somehow the standard side, 
develops into a, uh, a more appealing dog for the masses, uh, I don't see how things are going to change really good. And that's actually my goal, I've said, because I, I, I'd like to, you know, every breeder should have a goal of leaving the breed better than when he found it. And when you develop a bloodline for this many years, this much work, I'd like it to, to stick around. You know, I'd like it to be, I'd, you know, everybody wants to be the Lewis Colby or the, the guy that, you know, produced a bloodline that is head and shoulders above everything else. <clears throat> I've already, my dogs have already, unfortunately, a lot of my early dogs are already a huge portion of the bully crowd. Unfortunately, I hadn't solved the breeding issue back then. You know, uh, a lot of people have a good percentage of my blood in their dogs, but it's from 15, 10, 20 years ago. And those dogs were the same as what all the bad breeding dogs are now. Like I said, even in my yard, uh, not every dog is equal as far as breathing. You know, I, I made it a goal to produce dogs that could hunt and work for a hunter, and I've done it. I've got dozens of dogs with hog hunters. Unfortunately, <laughs> they're not, when I show them to people, they're not dogs that anybody is like, oh my God, let me give you 1500 bucks. Oh, let me get on a waiting list. No, they're dogs that, uh, oh, I get comments from the geniuses in our breed that say, that's unrecognizable. That doesn't even look like an American bulldog. They're supposed to have bowed legs in the front, and they're supposed to have a short two-inch muzzle, which, you know, my dogs, a lot of them have, the, even the hog hunting dogs have a two and a quarter, two and a half inch muzzle. <clears throat> the problem is the, the, the standard reads two to three inches. But if you pulled out a, a, a ruler and measured the typical show dog and bully dogs, I guarantee you their muzzle's under two inches. There's some of the most famous American bulldogs out there have a one and a quarter inch muzzle. So it's just, uh, I guess, the nature of the beast. These dog shows and dog breeding, it just leans towards the extreme uh, for looks and whatever the whim of if a of a... 21 inch dog that's 100 pounds is good then a 20 inch dog that's 110 is better and unfortunately that seems to be the downfall of everything my big thing is the history of the dog um, you know i don't have facts on that i don't that's my theory my hypothesis from my gathering of what i think i'm pretty sure but on the black dogs those are facts though that's the history of the dogs you know, did somebody cross a black pit bull in? Yeah, and the standard dogs have been documented. And the bully dogs, <clears throat> I don't think so. I mean, I know the basic core came from Ellerby and uh, this dog Aslan. Uh, if there's any other ones, I don't, I would never, they're obscure and I've never heard of them, but that's pretty much the theory. That's not a theory, that's facts of where the origin of the black American bulldog came from. Unfortunately, a lot of people show up and they're like, well, no, these dogs have always been white. And that's bullshit. That dog is a cross, obviously. But they just don't know the history. And sure, yeah, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, a black American bulldog was rare. <clears throat> but that's how breeds are. Uh, 30 years ago, what, what is common today, they call a hybrid, a Johnson, uh, a classic standard cross in between dog didn't exist. So does that mean that those dogs aren't real or they're a recent cross? No, it just means people select for traits. They can select for color. They can select for everything. Uh, a dog's gene pool is malleable. I mean, it, it, that's why we have Chihuahuas and we have Great Danes and they can come from the same species. So yeah, there wasn't a million black dogs 20 years ago. There are tons of them now because they're sought after. It might be for the wrong reason. Might be for cosmetics, obviously, or whatever. But that doesn't mean that they're a recent cross. But I appreciate your time. It's been a pleasure. I've, I've listened to a lot of your interviews, and I really enjoy all the different ones, especially the, the game-bred dog ones. 
uh, I really, I really enjoy listening to them. I, I have a business where I cut grass, so I'm constantly on a lawnmower, and I'll put my earbuds in and listen to stuff all day. So I've enjoyed Battle Bread, uh, all the series of interviews you've done. It's been great. I appreciate that, man, and um, I hope to, uh, I hope to get some more um, topics together so we could do this again. <laughs> 